Mr Keith, before we start, uh, I'd like to express my concern about reports in the press over the last few days of the contents of Mr Johnson's witness statement to the inquiry and what his evidence will be. Uh, until a witness is called and appears at a hearing or the inquiry publishes the witness's statement, it's meant to be confidential between the witness, the inquiry and the core participants. And I wish to remind all those involved in the inquiry process that they must maintain this confidentiality so as to allow the sharing of materials prior to hearings between those most involved in the inquiry process. Failing to respect confidentiality undermines the inquiry's ability to do its job fairly, effectively and independently. Thank, Thank you, you, my lady. Well, my lady, today's witness is Boris Johnson. I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Could you commence your evidence, please, by giving us your full name? Uh, Alexander Boris de Feffel Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Thank you for attending today and for the provision of your witness statement, 255836. It's dated the 31st of August, as you know, and um, it contains the usual declaration as to the truth of its contents on the final page, I think page 233. Mr Johnson, <coughs> you were, of course, Prime Minister between the <coughs> 24th of July 2019, when you were invited to form an administration following the resignation of Theresa May, MP as leader of the Conservative Party, and the 6th of September 2022, you having announced your resignation earlier that year on the 7th of July. Is that correct? Yes, it, it is, uh, Mr Keith. By your, your leave, uh, your, uh, my lady, can I just say how glad I am to be at this uh, inquiry and uh, how sorry I am for the, the pain and the loss and the suffering sit down. of please, the please stop. COVID Johnson. victims. Please sit down. Please sit down or I'm afraid you'll have to leave the hearing room. I'm sorry, if you don't sit down, I'm going to ask the ushers to get you to leave. Right, could ushers, please, could you ask them to leave? Could I say, by your leave, uh, that I understand the feelings of, the, of these victims and their families, and I am deeply sorry for the pain and the loss and the suffering of those victims and, and their families. And grateful though I am, to the hundreds of thousands of healthcare workers uh, and many other public servants and people in all walks of life who helped to protect our country throughout a dreadful pandemic, I do hope that this inquiry will help to get the answers to the very difficult questions that uh, those victims and those families are, are rightly are asking so that we can protect ourselves better, help each other to help protect ourselves better in the future and prevent further suffering. And if it's not too impertinent, may I say, as the person, who, as you rightly say, Mr Keith, who set up this in inquiry, how grateful I am to you for, for what you're doing and uh, for the immense care that you are plainly taking. Thank you. Mr Johnson, just a few more questions more, please, in relation to your career. Um, on the 9th of June 2023, did you announce your intention to stand down as the Member of Parliament for uh, Uxbridge and South Ryslip? You then, I think, formally resigned the following Monday, the 12th of June, when you were appointed steward and bailiff of the 300s of Chilton. You were, of course, previously Foreign Secretary and Mayor of, of London. You correctly observe that you yourself announced the institution of this statutory inquiry 
on the 12th of May 2021, you ordered the institution of a full and independent public inquiry, did you not? I did, uh, Mr Keith, and I uh, believe that's the right way forward. When you made that announcement, you said this. Amid such tragedy, the state has an obligation to examine its actions as rigorously and candidly as possible. The number of deaths across the United Kingdom, calculated whether by <coughs> registration on the death certificate through COVID or the measure of excess deaths, it is now over 230,000. By any measure, Mr Johnson, that is a, a shocking figure and a terrible loss of life. Is that the tragedy to which you were referring when you said, in this tragedy, the state has an obligation to examine its actions? Uh, it, that is certainly the, the, the core of the tragedy, yes. Do you agree that if the protection of life is the preeminent duty that every government owes to its citizens, then the number of those who died is an important, if not the most important, marker against which your administration must be measured. I, I, I certainly think it's the, the... It was what we were trying to prevent, was the loss of life, absolutely. The virus left in its wake, of course, not just death, but injury and misery, and indirectly through the lockdowns, it left pain and incalculable economic and societal damage. Were those and are those impacts which you also envisaged this inquiry would look at when you ordered its institution? Of course. Do you accept, and we may I think presume from your opening remarks that you do, do you accept that the bereaved and those who suffered, of whom there are very many in number, are entitled to no less than an absolutely full and rigorous scrutiny? Of course. When you made that announcement, you also said that this process will place the state's actions under the microscope and the government would be required to disclose all relevant information. In light of those words, could I just ask you please to confirm what your approach has been to the disclosure of your own COVID-related emails, WhatsApps and notes? I've done my best to give everything of any conceivable relevance. Has that always been your position, Mr Johnson? Yes. Could we have 265619, please, page 68? This is a, a WhatsApp between your former uh, Permanent Secretary number 10 and then latterly Cabinet Secretary and your principal private secretary Simon Case and respectively Martin Reynolds. And the Cabinet Secretary said the Prime Minister is mad if he doesn't think his WhatsApps will become public via the COVID inquiry. He was clearly not in the mood for that discussion tonight. That date, the 20th of December 2021, was just five days after you had in fact appointed Milady as the chair of this inquiry. Was there a debate at that time within government as to whether or not your WhatsApps should be disclosed, and if so, whether or not they would become public by virtue of their disclosure in this process? I, I don't remember that, the conversation to which the Cabinet Secretary is referring, and uh, I've handed over all the relevant WhatsApps. The inquiry has indeed requested all the key COVID-related texts, WhatsApps, and so on, from January 20 to February 22. Uh, and it must be made absolutely clear that throughout the course of the litigation in the summer and throughout these proceedings, you, you have um, made available, um, it would seem, everything in your possession. You made clear, I think, through your solicitor, solicitors, however, that you had a phone which you used uh, from May 2021, and you've made available the WhatsApps and the emails from that phone therefore between May 21 and February 22, the end of the period that the inquiry was requesting about. But following a, a well-publicised security breach, you had not been able yeah. 
to use the uh, to access the previous phone because you'd stop using it and you were fearful that if you try to access it you'd delete its data is that right that's right were you able to get access ultimately to the contents of that first phone the old phone yes so it, we sent it off to some technical people and they they activated it was there a time gap as your solicitors have described it on that phone um, a period between the 30th of January 2020 and June 2020, uh, during which time the WhatsApps have not been um, yes. capable of being uh, uh, reinstalled yeah. and, and disclosed. That's right. Do you know why your phone was missing those 5,000 odd WhatsApps? I don't know the exact reason, but it looks as though it's something to do with the app going down and then uh, coming up again. Um, but somehow uh, not it, it, it automatically erasing all the things uh, between that date when, when it went down and the moment when it was last backed up. Mm. So I... I can't give you the technical explanation, but that's the best I'm able to give. The technical report that your solicitors kindly provided demonstrates that there may have been a factory reset of the phone at the end of January 2020, and then an attempt to reinstall the contents later in June 2020. May I just ask you this? Was it you, if that was a, a factory reset that was done, was it you that tried to reset the phone or not? A factory reset? There, was a, there is a device or a capability on the phone which allows its contents to be entirely reset. I, that wasn't I, you. I don't remember any such thing. And during the course of the litigation this summer between the inquiry and the Cabinet Office, did you, of course, make plain your stated wish that the WhatsApps, which were the subject of that litigation, should be disclosed? Yes. They being your own WhatsApps. All right. Can I, for the avoidance of doubt, make it absolutely clear I haven't removed any WhatsApps from my phone and I've given you everything that I think you need? I, I ask, Mr Johnson, b because this issue has been trailed in the press. Yeah, no, I get you. And yeah. um, it's important yeah. that you have an opportunity of explaining why those WhatsApps yeah. are not available. In your witness statement at paragraph 10, you say, Mr Johnson, that unquestionably mistakes were made. And for those you say, you unreservedly apologise. We have the statement there. I'd like you, please, to set out in broad terms, of course we'll be looking at the detail of it later, but in broad terms, what mistakes you refer to there. Bearing in mind that we are only concerned in this module, Mr Johnson, with the core decision-making, with the lockdown decisions, the NPIs, the non-pharmacological interventions, and so on, not vaccines, therapy, yeah. drugs, antivirals. Okay. What, what mistakes do you unque uh, unquestionably accept were made? Well, I, I think if you look at my statement, I point out that we were relying so much on messaging to help contain the virus, and uh, we needed a uh, the public to understand the message in as straightforward away as, as possible, and, they, and they, they really did, by and large. One problem we had that I mention is that uh, because of the uh, very, you know, natural uh, and proper right of the d devolved administrations to have their own approach, sometimes there was a bit of... Co so the BBC News would, would have one message from number 10, then a slightly different one from... Scotland or wherever, and that I think we need to sort that out in future. And uh, you know, I'm sure there are plenty of other things that we could have done differently, uh, but I, I have no doubt it will come to them in the course of the examination. So your position today is, and you appear to refer to it as the first issue, that the primary mistake made rest in the context of the messaging and the all communications with the devolved administration. Well, you, you asked me to 
to cite a mistake that we made. I didn't say that was the primary mistake. What, what, but what primary mistakes, Mr Johnson, are you referring to in paragraph 10 when you say there was terrible suffering, but in relation to which, where we failed, I apologise again. For what are you apologising in that statement? Well, I, I, I think, just to, to go back to your, your, your main point, which is that so many people suffered, so many people lost their lives. Inevitably, in the course of trying to handle a very, very difficult pandemic in which we had to balance appalling harms on either side of the, of the decision, uh, we may have, have made mistakes. I think it, I don't want to try to anticipate the, the discussion, which I'm sure we will get into, about um, the, the timings of uh, MPIs, of lockdowns. Um, in inevitably, we, we got some things wrong. Um, I think we were doing our best at the, at the time, given, given what we knew, given the information I had available to me at the time, I think we, we did our level best. Um, were there things that we should have done differently? Unquestionably. Uh, but, you know, I would, I would struggle to, to itemise them all before you now in, 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 a, in, a, in a hierarchy, I'm afraid. I think it, it would be... I'd find it easier uh, to try and explain what happened as we went through. You say in your witness statement, we, I, unquestionably made mistakes. Can you draw a distinction for us, please, between yourself personally and the government? To, to what extent do you accept I take personal responsibility as opposed to accepting it on behalf of your administration? So I take personal responsibility for all the decisions that we made. It's obvious, Mr Johnson, that many of the most difficult and momentous decisions rested upon your own shoulders as Prime Minister. Do you take responsibility for whatever my lady makes of the speed of the government's response in January, February, March of 2020? Of course. And the way in which the various moving parts of the government, the advisory committees, the departments, the agencies and so on responded? Of course. Do you take responsibility for the lockdown decisions, whichever way they went, and their timeliness, whatever my lady makes of, of them? the manner in which patients were discharged from hospitals into the care sector. Of course. The explosion of the virus within the residential care sector. Yes. The general speed at which the restrictions were eased. Yes. The Eat Out to Help Out scheme. Yes. And then, latterly in 2020, the decision not to introduce a circuit breaker in September or October or to introduce a tier system earlier when the prevalence of the virus was lower for good or ill. Yes, though we did have local restrictions from a very early, early day, we did. May I just ask you, please, this question also. You, you refer to mistakes. Uh, it's very important that the inquiry understands to what extent it's accepted that there were mistakes as opposed to an acceptance that with hindsight the government could have done better. Do you mean there were failings, things or decisions that you got avoidably wrong, whether because they were the wrong decisions or because your management and leadership meant that the right decisions were less likely to be taken? Or do you mean, with hindsight, you just could have done better? Well, that's a sort of deterministic question, isn't it? Well, it's uh, an I important think, I think I think the... Um, the answer is that, uh, with hindsight, it may be easy to, to see things that we could have done uh, differently, or it may be possible to see things that we could have done differently. At the time, I felt, and I know that everybody else felt, that uh, we were doing our best in very difficult circumstances to protect life and, and protect the NHS. It is impossible and arguably improper to attribute any 
individual death causally to any particular governmental decision, as I know you know, and, and no possible purpose would be served in such an exercise. But do you accept that overall the government decision making, not the pandemic, but the government decision making in response, led materially to there being a greater number of excess deaths in the United Kingdom than might otherwise have been the case? Uh, I, I can't give you the answer to that question. Uh, I'm not sure. I noticed the, um, that in your opening preamble a few months ago, you produced a slide saying that the UK was, I think, second only to, to Italy for excess deaths. Correct. Uh, that's not, to the best of my knowledge, the, the case. Um, and I think that many other, all I would say is that many, many other countries suffered terrible losses from COVID. They did. And the, the, the evidence that I've seen suggests that we were well down the, the European table and, and well down the, uh, the world table. Though that is, of course, no comfort to uh, the bereaved and their, and their families. I, that, that seems to be the statistical reality. The evidence before my lady is that the United Kingdom had one of the highest rates of excess death in Europe. Almost all other Western European countries had a lower level of excess death. Well, I've seen. Italy was tragically um, in a worse position than the United Kingdom. Well, I, I, don't wish, I don't wish to, to contradict you, Mr. Keith, but the, the evidence, the, the uh, ONS data I saw put us, I think, about 16th or, or 19th in a table of 33. In Western Europe, we were one of the worst off, if not the second worst off. You must have long reflected since that time why that was so. Why do you think that we had the rate of excess deaths in this country that we did ultimately have? As I say, I think that the statistics vary, and I think that the, um, every country struggled with a new pandemic. Um, and I think the, the UK, from the evidence that I have seen, was well down the European table and obviously even further down the, the, the world table. Uh, if I had to answer why I think we face particular headwinds, I would say it was irrespective of, of government action, uh, we have a, uh, a, an elderly population, extremely elderly population. Uh, we do suffer, sadly, from lots of, of uh, COVID-related comorbidities. And uh, we are a very, very densely populated country, the second most densely populated country in, in Europe. And that, that did not help. Do you accept that government actions materially contributed to that outcome. It wasn't just a matter of the state of the healthcare system, density, age of population, and the, in fact, the well, geographical location of the United Kingdom. G given that uh, other countries have excellent healthcare systems and uh, face similar problems and ended up in uh, a uh, statistically uh, with more excess deaths per, uh, per 100,000? The answer is, I don't know. I don't know. You're obviously extremely well aware of the argument that the lockdown decisions themselves, cumulatively and individually, contributed to the number of excess deaths. What do you say to that? I say that I, I, I don't know, but uh, I, I'm aware of the, the arguments that are made. What I would say respectfully to people is that they were very, very difficult decisions. And the, time, the issue of the timeliness of, of lockdowns was clearly one that we considered very hard at the time. And you, you will have seen from the evidence uh, uh, that there were strong arguments against going too early into lockdowns, especially when it came to that first series of March NPIs. And you'll remember the arguments that were made 
two arguments uh, against early action, and they were the risk of behavioral fatigue and then the risk of, of, of bounce back or, or what you've called uncoiling of the spring. And they were made powerfully and they, they certainly had a big effect on me. Could you assist the inquiry, please, with something about the nature of the, the heavy responsibility which rested on your shoulders? It is perhaps self-evident that only the most difficult and momentous decisions come for the Prime Minister. That's correct. Were there any good or easy decisions to be made in this context? No. I, I can't think of a single... Well, I suppose it was a, a, an easy decision to say that um, we should go ahead with the rollout of, of both Pfizer and AstraZeneca as soon as they've been approved by... The, by the uh, by the MHRA, but there were no when it came to the forgive me, Mr. Keith, but when it came to the the balancing of the need to protect the public and protect the NHS and the damage done by lockdowns, it was incredibly difficult. Pause there, please. I do understand emotions are running very high. I do, and I think it's most unfortunate when I have to ask people to leave. But we have to ensure that this hearing is effective. And it's got to be effective not just for people in this hearing room, but for people watching on the on, online streaming. So please make sure your behaviour is appropriate to a public hearing of a statutory inquiry. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt. No, it's fine. No. We'll look at the nature of the particular decisions in, in greater detail later. But broadly speaking, so that we know the lie of the land and, and we know how you approach these issues, were the majority of the most momentous decisions, the decisions, for example, to impose the lockdowns and social distancing measures and so on, were they decisions that were in practice made by you, yes. even if they were affirmed or endorsed by the Cabinet later, or were they decisions that were entirely open-endedly made by Cabinet? I, that's a very good question, because I think it was, it was both. Uh, a huge number of decisions, because they had to be taken so fast, were funneled up directly to me, but there were also a large number of decisions, and I do think this maybe hasn't come out as, as much as it should were the subject of exhaustive cabinet discussion. In his witness statement, M Michael Gove has said that the wider cabinet was brought into decisions at times too late and too little. Mr Javid has said in his witness statement that the cabinet was designed in his view to place Dominic Cummings and the Prime Minister as the decision makers to centralise power in number 10. And in his own witness statement, Mr Cummings has said that the Cabinet was largely irrelevant to policy or execution on account of the leaks, your inability to chair it, and because it was seen by Number 10 as not being a serious place for serious discussion. I don't think that's true. I think there were some really excellent Cabinet discussions um, about the, the trade-offs. If I had to make a comment about Cabinet as a whole in, in terms of the um, the speed of, of, of lockdowns, which was your, what we're talking about, um, I think it probably would be fair to say that the, the Cabinet was, uh, on the whole, uh, more reluctant to impose MPIs than necessarily than, than I was. That wasn't true for every member of the Cabinet, but, but that would be a general, a general comment. The lockdown decision of the 23rd of March 2020 was debated, as you rightly say, at great length on the Sunday, on the Monday, by the various bodies, but in particular COBRA. But it was debated in COBRA on Monday the 23rd. A public announcement, we'll all recall, was made that day, that evening, in fact, and then it went to Cabinet on the Tuesday. So in relation to the first lockdown decision, it's obvious that Cabinet debated it after the event. In relation to the second lockdown, that of November 2020, Mr Johnson. Do you recall whether or not that decision was made by a COVID ministerial committee or by Cabinet? Uh, I, I, I'm afraid I can't remember the, the, right. the, the sequence there, but just 
picking you up on the on the first the first lockdown, which was actually a, a, a sort of crescendo of of measures. I'm fairly certain we had a, a, a long cabinet call, at least, to to discuss it. Well, we'll look at that in detail later. The inquiries heard um, a great deal of evidence, Mr. Johnson, about the way in which your secretaries of state would naturally and permissibly come at the same issue, whether or not to have a lockdown, whether to ease, whether to have a, a tier system and the like, from, from different angles. The Secretary of State for Health and Social Care, understandably, would promote the public health consequences and, and the need to act in the public health. The Chancellor would frequently promote the economic considerations, but all it's obvious, we're aware to greater or lesser degree of the societal and economic harm that would result from the decisions that you were having to contemplate making. Who ultimately had to weigh up and determine the competing public interest considerations, public health, societal harm, economic damage, and so on? On whose shoulders rested that debate? That, that's the job of the Prime Minister, and there's, there's only the Prime Minister that can, can do that. But I think that that wasn't actually a, a bad way of doing it, to have different interests represented by different Secretaries of State and different departments. Presumably you needed the advice of your close advisers, your Cabinet Secretary and, and those in the civil service, in addition to the advice that you were receiving from of your Secretaries of State. Could you give, please, the inquiry an indication as to the identity of the persons upon whom you were most reliant in that debate, in that weighing up exercise? Well, I don't, I don't wish to um, embarrass distinguished uh, um, public officials by, by, by naming them. Uh, I, don't know, I don't know what the... Well, uh, I, I find that civil servants on the whole are, are quite happy to to uh, remain um, anonymous, but I can, I can certainly tell you that I had superb uh, deputy uh, private secretary, uh, a mathematician, uh, an economist who is brilliant in, in understanding uh, healthcare issues, uh, and an absolutely brilliant private secretary for, for healthcare. The inquiry has obviously heard from a number of advisors I think you've and heard civil from, I think you've heard from both of those individuals. So. The, the, there's no debate about their identity, Mr. Johnson, and, and no, uh, no risk. You may need to make the question a bit more specific, yes. Mr. Keith. The evidence is, Mr. Johnson, that you received advice from advisers in number 10. Yes. Obviously, your chief advisor, Mr. Cummings. Yes. You received advice from the Cabinet Secretary, firstly, yes. Mark Sedwell, and then latterly, Simon Case, you received advice from the CMO yes. and then the General Chief Scientific Advisor. Yes, I'm sorry, I should, have, I should have cited them uh, first, yes. It's apparent that on top of the formal advisory structures, the meetings with the CMO and the GCSA, the meetings with the Cabinet Secretary, the meetings with your ministers, you had a profusion of meetings with your Chief Advisor, Mr Cummings, with your... Uh, cabinet secretary, with your permanent, uh, with your principal private secretary, and so on. There were a huge number of rolling meetings with your innermost group of advisers, and I want to know to what extent, therefore, you came to rely upon them in the ultimate decision-making process. I, of course, relied on the advice I was given, but the way it works is advisers advise and ministers decide, and that was what happened. You received a great deal of advice from the Chief Medical Officer and yes. the government's scientific chief advisor. They were a vital source of advice, yes. that's obvious. You were aware that SAGE met hundreds of times, yes. that's to say the scientific advisory group for emergencies. Did you ever read their minutes or were you wholly reliant on the CMO and the GCSA to relay to you what SAGE had said? I think I, I, think I did once or twice look at the, or maybe more than that, I looked at the, what Sage had actually said, and Sage certainly produced a, a lot of uh, documentation. But I think that 
the CSA and the CMO did an outstanding job of leading SAGE and of distilling their views and conveying them to me. The SAGE minutes were described as consensus minutes because they were designed to be read at speed, to be able to get to the heart of the issue immediately on, on reading them, and, and, to, and to ensure that um, the advice that was being given would be yes. readily and speedily understood. Did you ever think of calling as a general practice for those minutes so that you could yourself read them? Many of them were only eight or nine pages long. As I say, I think I did, uh, from time to time, look at the, the consensus minutes. I think, in retrospect, it might have been valuable to try to, to hear the sage conversation uh, unpasteurised itself. But I, I didn't. I, I, was, I was more than content with the um, very clear summaries that I was getting from the, the CSA and the CMO. There were hundreds of consensus minutes, but you read only or were given only a fraction of them. I, that sounds right to me, yes. All right. We'll look in detail at some of the scientific debates that engage government, particularly in the middle of March. Behavioural fatigue, herd immunity, the debate about the reasonable worst-case scenario and so on. Yes. Did you not think of looking at the, the scientific horse in the mouth and seeing what was actually being said by the government's primary scientific advisory committee on these issues when you, as now appears to be the case, you were, you became engaged, particularly in the debate of behavioural fatigue. Why didn't you call for the primary material? I think that's a good question. I, I was very, very much um, impressed and de by and dependent upon uh, the CMO and the, the CSA, both of whom are outstanding experts in their field. And it felt to me that I, I couldn't do better than that. The CMO and the, CS, uh, the SCA were, of course, concerned with medicine and science. And Sage was concerned, as it says on the tin, with, with science. Well, CMO is a professor of public health. I mean, he, 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 knows, he knows an awful lot about um, uh, epidemiology and, and public behaviour in an epidemic. He does. You had no advisory structure around you, however, and by contrast, that dealt with matters such as the economic damage yeah. that would be done by the lockdown decisions. There was no pandemic or civil emergency or societal advisory body which might be thought to be analogous to SAGE. In hindsight, and with the passage of time, do, do you suggest that there was an absence of a proper advisory structure to deal with the other issues and the other considerations which weighed in the balance when you came to make those final decisions? I've thought about that a, a great deal. and. I think in the end that there, there is such a, a body, and it's called HM Treasury, and that is what they do. And you referred earlier on, um, Mr Keith, to the, to the competing perspectives of the, of the Whitehall departments and the secretaries of, of state. And I think for all its difficulties, I, th I think it it did work well in allowing me to get a balance of the argument. The evidence appears already to suggest that the, the Chancellor Exchequer and then Her Majesty's Treasury had considerable influence over the ultimate decision-making process because the Chancellor would come and see you in bilateral meetings. There were bilateral meetings in the week of the 16th of March yeah. before the first lockdown decision in late October before the second in the summer of 21 and then again in December of 21 in relation to Omicron and also eat out to help out. But that advice was given to you by the Chancellor and Her Majesty's Treasury in a way that wasn't openly transparent in the way that the SAGE advice was provided to you. 
there were no minutes disclosed of the advice that you were being given to the public. There was no regular production of material or any kind of published transparent economic analysis provided to you. Do you think in hindsight that that was an error? I think that there was certainly um, transparent economic uh, analysis of the cost of some of the measures that we were obliged to enact and the um, uh, fall in GDP, the, the, the cost of the uh, CJRS the, the, and the other schemes was, was plain for all to, to see. Uh, that, was all, that was all public. Um, of course, what was not public and is not traditionally public is, the, is ministerial conversations and, and uh, discussion between ministers. But again, I think the perspective that I was being offered by the Treasury uh, was a very useful one, just as the perspective of the Department of Health was a very useful one. The material, so that's to say diary entries and readouts of minutes and so on, Mr Johnson, show that the, the, the Chancellor of the Exchequer would, in this difficult context of making the ultimate decisions about lockdowns and easing and tears and so on, often get the last word by way of a bilateral meeting that would take place just before you made a final decision. And also that the Secretary of State for Health and Social Care was occasionally excluded from meetings when public health matters were being discussed. Were you aware of that? I, 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 I think that's... I, I don't... I reject that characterisation of, of what took place. Um, the, over, the, the overwhelming priority of the government was protect the NHS, save life. That was our, obje our objective. And that was where my officials were, were coming from. That was what we wanted to do. And I think it was important in that, in that context to... You know, we had, there were lots of things we had to do that were very difficult, very costly. And it was right to have endless conversations with the Treasury. It was what, was what we did. You know, of course, that a great deal of evidence has been given to Milady about the operation and the competence of your administration. It needs to be stated absolutely plainly that the inquiry has absolutely no interest in the, in the salaciousness or the, the nature of Mr Cummings' linguistic style or the WhatsApps. But it does have an interest, of course, in whether or not his communications revealed an abusive and misogynistic impact. The WhatsApps and the texts shed a direct light on the competence of the government, how well or not the government machinery operated, what you all thought about each other, and what some of you thought privately about the decisions that were being taken. <clears throat> We're going to look in detail at them later, but it's fair to say that in the round that material paints yes. a appalling picture, not all the time, but can at I, times of incompetence and disarray. Can I comment on that? I, I, I think Please. that um, the two things need to be separated out there. Um, I think it is certainly true that this inquiry has, and, and I'm, I'm glad of it, has dredged up a phenomenal quantity of the type of material that would never have been available to any previous inquiry into doings in number 10 because it's, it's WhatsApp communications of a kind that would not have been possible. And that's a, that's a good thing because you can get a, a texture of the a feeling for the, for the relationships and the, uh, and the human beings. I would make a, a couple of points. First of all, uh, a, a lot of the, the language, the style that you refer to is completely unknown to me uh, or indeed to anybody else not on, the, on that group. Uh, I've apologised to one particular person who suffered uh, abuse in that, uh, in one of those publicised uh, WhatsApp exchanges. Um, but I would make a distinction between the type of language used 
and the decision-making processes of the government and what we got done. And I would submit that any powerful and effective government has, and I think of the, the Thatcher government or the Blair government, uh, has a lot of uh, challenging and competing characters uh, whose views about each other uh, might not be fit uh, to print, uh, but to get an awful lot done. And that's what we did. Your own Cabinet Secretary, Mark Sedwell, um, he was, of course, asked to move on, and we'll come to that later in May 2020, described, according to Sir Patrick Vallance, your administration as brutal and useless, and observed that it was hard to motivate people in number 10 in such terrible times if they were being shot in the back. That would appear to be a reference to the doings, as you say, of number 10, to the process and the operation of government, as opposed to the atmospherics. Would you not agree? Uh, again, I, I think that actually what you're looking at in, in all this, uh, this stuff is a lot of highly talented and highly motivated people who are uh, stricken with anxiety about what is happening, uh, about the, the pandemic, who, who are doing their best, and who, like all human beings, under great stress and, and great anxiety about themselves and their own performance, will be inclined to be critical of others. And I think that that would have been the same of any administration facing the same sort of challenges uh, on, on that scale. But do you accept that there is a considerable body of material which, which addresses not just their private thoughts of the other individuals in government, of them personally, but relates to the performance of government, to the way in which your administration actually operated? Do you yes, accept that as a general proposition? I do, and I think that that was a good and a healthy thing, because we needed, const given the scale of what we were facing, we needed constantly to challenge ourselves and constantly to try to, to do better. Your own chief advisor, Mr Cummings, described on the 4th of May something the government had done as being the best success of the whole criminally incompetent government performance. How, how could that be a good thing? Because what he is trying to, to do is to... He's, he's ex, not for me to explain his, his quotation. You can, you can ask him yourself. But what we were generally trying to, to do was to make sure that we delivered the best possible service for the people of the UK who were going through an absolutely terrible, terrible time. And it, it would not have been right to have a, a, a load of, if, a, if we'd had a load of WhatsApp saying, aren't we doing brilliantly, folks? Uh, isn't this going well? I think you, your criticisms might have been, frankly, even uh, more pungent. On the 27th of March, after Mr Cummings had asserted that Whitehall had nearly killed huge numbers of people and cost millions of jobs, and that Mr Hancock had failed to get on top of the testing problems, you yourself said these three words, totally fucking hopeless. That was a reference think, to the performance of an think, important part of government. Right, I'd stress the word nearly in that. No, uh, in your that that response, thing. Mr Johnson. And I, I would say that my job was not to not uncritically to accept that everything we were doing was good, though I, I as it happens, as I, as I said to you, I do think that the, one, the country as a whole had notable achievements during the, the crisis. My job was to try to get a load of quite disparate, quite challenging characters to keep going and uh, through a long period and to keep doing their level best to protect the country. That was my job. Do you accept the evidence from Helen McNamara, about which you will be aware, and also from former cabinet secretaries, that Mr Cummings himself contributed to such a toxic atmosphere that civil servants simply didn't want to work in the heart of government? Helen McNamara said, the relationships in Number 10 and the Cabinet Office had a real and damaging impact. You were told directly by Simon Case on the 2nd of July lots of top-draw people had refused to come 
to work because of the toxic reputation of your, I emphasize your operation. Were you aware that there were individuals, civil servants and advisors who were not prepared to work in your administration because of the atmosphere and the working relationships which were in play? First of all, no. Uh, second, I was not aware of that. Uh, se secondly, um, I didn't see any sign of that. I, I saw uh, brilliantly talented people uh, when we wanted, when we advertised for a post, when we wanted to recruit for a, a position in my private office. We had, as far as I could see, no difficulty getting wonderful people to to step forward. I think, if I might make one, I think one self-criticism, or another self-criticism, I think that the, the gender balance of my team should have been better. And if, to, to your earlier question, looking back at it, um, when I was running London, it was great and it was 50-50 and it was a very harmonious team. I think sometimes during the pandemic, too many meetings were too too male dominated, if I'm absolutely honest with you. And I think that was a, I tried sometimes to rectify it. I tried to recruit uh, a former colleague from, uh, from City Hall, uh, but I think that was, a, that was something we should have done better. Simon Case, who was then the Permanent Secretary in Number 10, WhatsApped you yourself on the 2nd of July to say that lots of people, lots of top draw people had refused to come because of the toxic reputation of your operation. Well, I don't remember that. What did you do? I, I, don't rem I don't remember that. And uh, my impression was that the, we had no difficulty recruiting the best possible people. Could we have, please, 48313, page 16, on the screen? These are communications between Mr. Cummings and yourself in May 2020, where we're concerned with the, the bottom half of the page. So can you expand it, because I can't? Yes, 7th of May, Hancock is unfit for this job. The incompetence, the constant lies, the obsession with media bullshit. Reference to testing, you must ask him where we'll get 500,000 per day, and where's your plan for testing? Hello. And if you can scroll back out, but, just, sorry, I don't pause, just pause a second, Mr. Johnson. If you then scroll in, please, to the bottom half of the page, the last part. Mr. Cummings says, yeah. it'll certainly be a cock-up like everything else, but it'll be far from the worst of our cock-ups over the next eight weeks. You need to think of Vinnie Hancock, and so on and so forth. You cannot suggest that you are unaware of the opinion taken by your chief advisor over your Secretary of State for Health. You cannot suggest you are unaware of the concerns expressed by your Cabinet Secretary about the toxic reputation of your operation, because he wants to you directly. You cannot suggest that there weren't grave concerns being expressed in Downing Street, that there were people who simply would not come and work for you because of the atmosphere you allow to develop? So, uh, first of all, in, in politics, there's uh, never a time when you're not, if you're Prime Minister, you are constantly being lobbied by somebody to sack somebody else. Uh, it's just what I'm afraid happens, and uh, it's, it's part of life. Everybody's constantly militating against some other individual for some reason of, of, of their own. It's just, it's just the, I'm afraid that's the, the nature of it. Uh, it is perfectly true that this advisor in particular uh, thought, uh, had a low opinion of, of the health secretary. I thought he was wrong. Uh, I stuck by the health secretary. I thought the health secretary uh, worked very hard and whatever. He may have had uh, defects, but I thought that he uh, was doing his best in very difficult circumstances, and I thought he was a good communicator. Could we have 303245? Your first and then your second cabinet secretary communicate by WhatsApp, page nine.
Mr. Case refers at the top of the page to how you have told Mr. Cummings outright to stop talking to the media in his presence. This place is just insane, zero discipline. And then the bottom half of the page, these people are so mad, madly self-defeating. It's hard to ask people to march. It should be to the sound of gunfire. And then the cabinet secretary. The cabinet secretary is the head of the civil service. Is he or she not? I've never seen a bunch of people less well equipped to run a country. That's not a matter of atmospherics or lobbying or part of the general day in, day out friction within government, is it? Uh, yes, I, th I think it is. And um, I think that if, as I say, if you'd had the views of the Mandarinate about the Thatcher government in unexpurgated WhatsApps, my lady, uh, I think you would have found that they were pretty fruity. Um, it's, it's WhatsApp conversation is um, intended to be, uh, though clearly it isn't, uh, ephemeral. Um, it, it tends to, uh, the, to the pejorative and the hyperbolical. And I think that um, the, the, the worst vice, in my view, would have been to have had a, uh, an operation where everybody was so uh, deferential and, and so um, reluctant to, to make waves that they never expressed their opinion, uh, they never challenged, and they never doubted. It's, it was much more important to have a group of people who are willing to doubt themselves uh, and to doubt each other. And I, and I think that that was creatively useful rather than the reverse. Some of these senior advisers didn't just lack deference, to use your word, Mr. Johnson. They doubted you, and they doubted your ability and your competence, as you now know from having seen the material. Could we have, please, 273901, Page 188. That's from the 19th of September. Page 229. There is a reference to leadership position. Would you like me to... Correct? Yes, I'm, I'm just going to put, because it's, it's right and proper that, and, and fair that you're asked to give your sure. response to, to some of the material which has been produced to this inquiry. And then page 245. The Prime Minister begins to argue for letting it all rip. They've had a good innings. And there is a reference there to lack of leadership, the last yeah. line. This all feels like a complete lack of yeah. leadership. Look, so whether, let me put the question, whether or not these significant number of advisers correctly stated the position, whether or not this was genuine, whether or not there were significant failings in your own and your government's competence, would you accept that it is extraordinary that the government's chief scientific advisor, its chief advisor, its cabinet secretaries, its deputy cabinet secretary, should all be commenting in these terms about no. competence and about performance no. and about you. I think this is wholly uh, to be expected. And this is a, a period um, in which we are... Uh, where, where the country is going through a, a resurgence of the, of the virus. You're looking at the October uh, period. And uh, the, the Patrick, the CSA, talks about inconsistency. And uh, 
we've just got to face the, the reality. I've got to face the, the reality as, as, as Prime Minister that the, um, the, the virus seems to be refusing to uh, be suppressed by the measures we've used so far. We're going to need different measures. Um, we've come out of, of lockdown. We're going into uh, the tiering system. Um, of course, we're of course we're changing, but the, so did the collective understanding of the science. And if you look back at what happened during COVID, uh, we had a we had radically different views over the period, uh, over the efficacy of masks, over whether uh, asymptomatic uh, transmission uh, could take place. We had a totally different view. Uh, within months, about whether ventilators would be needed, I was told to, to begin with we needed 25 percent, 25 percent of patients would need ventilators. That turned out not to be true. Then, on this particular issue, you've got uh, you've got the scientists calling for us to go early and go hard, and this takes us back to your initial uh, line of questioning. Uh, when earlier on, they had been saying expressly that if you go hard too soon, then you have two problems, behavioural fatigue and bounce back. And the problem that I was facing, and it was an appalling problem in October, was that we didn't have therapeutics, or, or we didn't have, well, we had some therapeutics, but we didn't have a, a vaccine. We didn't have a, a, a way out, uh, a, a medical uh, solution. We were, we were being forced to use NPIs, and at this particular moment, I'm sure we'll come to the, the October-November uh, lockdowns, um, my anxiety was that we were going to have to do the same thing over and over again. And I, I think what those notebooks reflect and what the, all those comments reflect is the deep anxiety of a group of people doing their level best who cannot see an easy solution and are naturally self-critical and critical of others. All right. It's obvious that these things were said at the time. You say not to you, although I've put to you a WhatsApp which was sent directly to you. And there are, there are obviously others. Well, it's a WhatsApp that claims to have said something directly to me. Well, the WhatsApp has been taken, of course, from the material which you've provided and from, obviously, the phones from other people who are interlocutors. No, so, sorry, if I may correct you, Mr Keith, what that WhatsApp was was a, a WhatsApp from the Cabinet Secretary saying that he told me directly something. I don't think I saw the WhatsApp directly to me. Mark said, well, on the 2nd of July, WhatsApp to you directly to say... Lots of top draw people had refused to come because of the toxic reputation of your operation. I'm sorry. Whether this material indicates a significant failing at the heart of government and in failures of competence, they undoubtedly, well, these opinions were expressed at the time, and, and you no doubt accept you're responsible for that state of affairs. You must have reflected. Mr Johnson, long and hard, both whilst in office, in your dealings with Mr Cummings, and afterwards, on what lessons can be learned from the way in which power is exercised and the way in which government performs at the highest level. Have you reflected upon whether or not the, the system of SPADs, the system by which you receive advice from your political advisers, needs to be reformed? Have you reflected on the function and powers and the extent of powers of SPADs or on the competence of the ministers whose advice you accepted? Well, I think with hindsight, there's all sorts of things that you could do differently. I think at the time, I decided that it was best to have a, an atmosphere of, uh, of challenge with some strong characters giving me advice, and I, I valued that advice. Well, with hindsight... You can now see what was going on, and you've had this material for some time. Have you reflected on whether or not 
the inquiry could, if my lady sees fit, make recommendations about the way in which a character such as Mr Cummings, about whom some extremely strong views have been expressed, should be in the position that he was, views on whether or not the Prime Minister had access to the correct and proper forms of advice? Are these not issues that you've thought about? Yes, but I think overwhelmingly that I did have access to the correct and proper forms of, of advice. And if you ask upon whom I relied uh, for, for that advice, uh, it was the CMO and the CSA, uh, together with uh, the experts, the, uh, the officials in my private office. You lost confidence in your Cabinet Secretary in May 2020, did you not? Well, he asked to step aside. Did you lose confidence in your Cabinet Secretary in May 2020? Yeah, he asked to step aside. Did you lose confidence in your Chief Advisor, whom you described as engaging in an orgy of narcissism at the heart of your administration? Well, I think he also uh, stepped aside. Did you lose confidence in those senior advisers, Mr Johnson, and effectively dispose of them both? Well, uh, they, they both stepped aside from, uh, from government, but it was a very difficult, very challenging period. Uh, people were getting, as, as you can see from the, from the WhatsApps, they were getting um, very frazzled because they, they were frustrated. COVID kept coming at us in, in wave after wave, and it was very, very hard to, to fight it. And people were doing their level best. And I don't, you know, when people are, are, are critical of the, the guy at the top or they're critical of, e of each other, that's a, a reflection of the, the difficulty of the circumstances. When it, when the, it became e easier in, uh, in the spring in, uh, after the, during the vaccine rollout, people's tone changed. Of course it did. But it was a reflection of the, of the, the agony that the country was going through and that the government was going through. Lady, is that a convenient moment? I'm about to turn to a completely separate topic. Right. Uh, I shall return at 20 past. Thank you.
Mr Keith. Mr Johnson, we're now going to turn to look at the events of January and yes. February. Um, in your witness statement, you say that Mr Hancock spoke to you about his concerns um, around about the 7th of January. You say he rang you again on the 22nd of January. To put this in, in its chronologic, proper chronological place, the first SAGE had taken place on the 22nd of January, the first COBRA on the 24th of January. Um, he says, however, in his witness statement that he, he called you directly on at least four occasions during January to try and impress upon you his concerns. Although he does not say so, the implication is that he, he was at pains to try to alert you to the problems he saw it, and he was required to, to raise the matter with you repeatedly. Do you recall a repeated number of attempts to, to raise the alarm with you in that way? I certainly recall the conversation on the 7th of, of January and uh, the, uh, the context, and I, I remember thinking about it and saying to him, well, you know, keep, keep an eye on it, and, and I've set out in my, in my statement um, my initial instincts about it. Um, I, I don't, to be frank, remember all those conversations, but um, it's true that we would have spoken on many occasions because we, we generally spoke quite a, quite a lot. Um, I think that in that period, January really to the, to the end of, of, of February, um, towards the end of, of February, um, COVID was pretty much like a cloud on the horizon, no bigger than a man's hand. And you, you didn't know whether it was going to turn into a, a typhoon or not. And I certainly did didn't. I was unsure. And well, it became clear much later. The matter was first raised with your Cabinet Secretary, Mark Sedwell, formally on the 21st of January, uh, which was the date, in fact, of the World Health Organization first novel coronavirus situation report. Do you recall when the matter was first brought officially to your attention? You were obviously aware from news reports, and you'd been aware from your conversations with Mr Hancock as to the, the, the possible um, crisis or the emergence of this virus uh, in China. But when officially do you recall it was put before you? I, I, I'm sure it's in my, uh, in, in what I've submitted to the inquiry, Mr. Keith. I, I think it would be, it, the, certainly there are, there are cabinet discussions in, uh, in January and in, uh, and, and in February. Um, and a, a crescendo of activity about it. But it in, in government, it, it wasn't yet being escalated to me as something of, of really truly national concern. Indeed. A COBRA was convened, uh, chaired by Mr Hancock, on the 24th of January. And then he chaired a, a further COBRA meeting on the 29th of January, then the 5th of February, then the 18th of February, and then the 26th of February. Right. It's plain that was quite permissible. Cobra doesn't have to be chaired by a prime minister. Yep. Indeed, it can be chaired by an official. But the sheer frequency of those Cobras, there were then five Cobras within one month, all on the same issue of this emerging virus. Didn't the seriousness uh, of the position in, in late January make itself plain to you? How could there have been a need for a COBRA every week for five weeks in relation to an issue that didn't require your direct involvement as the Prime Minister? I think for the reason you've, you've given, which is uh, that a, a COBRA is a, a, a regular occurrence in, in government when there's something that a, uh, a particular government department is leading on. In this case, it was uh, it health. The possibility of a coronavirus pandemic, which was only declared by, by the WHO on the 12th of, of March, was, was not something that had yet been, uh, it hadn't really broken upon the political world, certainly in my consciousness, as something of a real potential, you know, a real potential national Disaster. Did and, you? And you know, it, it, in that period, end of January, beginning of February, it's it's end of January, beginning of February. It's it's not much in the political 
world. I wasn't asked about it, for instance, at all at PMQs. Were you even aware that Mr Hancock was chairing COBRAs to deal with a new and emerging respiratory virus I, on those five dates? I, I think that I was aware that Matt was handling it. Uh, I couldn't swear that I was aware that he was handling it in that way on all those particular dates. My instructions to him were to keep me posted and, and I would do what, whatever I could. But by the, by the end of the month, clearly, by the end of February, I'm getting anxious about what we're doing. We'll come there. Did you or do you recall having any debate with your advisers as to whether or not you should be chairing those COBRAs or whether or not the seriousness of the position required you to chair the COBRAs at the end of January and throughout February? Yes, I think, I think there's a, uh, an exchange. Um, I, I remember talking to my private office and saying, you know, uh, this is clearly becoming an issue of national... 24th of February. Thank you. Um, before that date, for the month beforehand, did you think to say to your officials, the Secretary of State for Health is chairing a COBRA now on a weekly basis to do with a fatal viral pandemic, which currently... Is but just it hadn't, yet, hadn't just, yet been just, declared as a, as a pandemic. By it time. hadn't been declared as a pandemic, but by the 16th of January, it had spread to Thailand and Japan. The scientists in the United Kingdom had reported on the 12% hospitalisation rate. It was clear from the material in government that only a small fraction of the infections in Wuhan were being detected, and there was already evidence of limited human-to-human -human transmission, all by the 16th of January. So... In an overarching sense, why do you think that the Prime Minister, yourself, was not informed earlier as to those extremely worrying features of this emerging virus? I, I think that the, here's what I really think happened. I think that actually everybody, had they stopped to think about it, could see the, the implications of the data uh, the implications of what was happening in uh, the numbers, the, the percentage of fat fatalities in uh, in China. Uh, but I, I don't think that they necessarily drew the, the right conclusions in that early phase, and uh, which is no, no fault of, of, of theirs. I think it, this what happened was something that was completely outside people's living memory. What we were, we were dealing with is like a once-in-a-century event. And I just don't think people computed the implications of, of, of that data. And it wasn't really escalated. It wasn't escalated to me as a, an issue of, of national concern until much later. And as, as you say, I, I said, look, I think I've got to, I've got to chair these Cobras. You, you were the Prime Minister... <laughs> You're obviously an extremely skilled politician and you have direct, intimate experience of, of running government. From the viewpoint of the bereaved and those who are terribly damaged and harmed by this pandemic, how could a government have generally failed to stop and think the system is there to make you think. The yeah. risk assessment processes and civil emergency procedures are there to make sure that you don't have to stop and think. It responds. But on this occasion, generally, and it's not a personal point, generally the system did not stop and think and say, this data yeah. shows there is a greater problem than we currently understand. I think that's... I, look, I think I've, I've tried in a way to, to, to give you the answer to that. I think that what, what really happened was, um, outside our living experience, we hadn't seen that, something like this for a, for a century or more. And what, what, but what we, unfortunately, what we did remember was not helpful. Because what we did remember, what the system did remember was things like SARS and, uh, and MERS and, and swine flu and, uh, and so on, other zoonotic uh, diseases that certainly had an impact in, in Asia, which is what we were seeing, but ultimately were relatively, if not wholly, benign 
in the UK? And if I had to, to guess an answer to your, to your question, Mr. Keith, I, I would say that that was probably the default mindset. And, and you know, and, and that was basically because of people were operating on the basis of their lived experience. So a failed mindset. I, I think it was a, um, a, a human, um, natural <laughs> response of, of people based on what they had themselves seen and observed in their lifetimes. But from the context, from, from the prism or from the viewpoint of the efficacy and the competence of the government response, regardless of the, the psychological issues that may have been preying on the minds of its constituent individual parts, that the government failed to wake up, did it not? It failed to understand the significance of the crisis and therefore it must follow, failed I, I, to take steps speedily enough. I think that it would certainly be fair to say of the, uh, of me, the entire Whitehall establishment, scientific uh, community included, our, our, our advisors included, that we underestimated the scale and the pace of the, of the challenge. The and 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 you you can see that very clearly in those early days in uh, in March from late February through to the the sequence of of NPIs of lockdowns. You, you can see that we A were all failure. we were all collectively uh, underestimating how fast it had already spread in the UK. Uh, we underestimated, we, we, we put the, the peak too, too late, the first peak too late. We thought it would be in you know, May, June. That was totally wrong. Um, I don't blame the, the scientists for, for that at all, but that was, that was, the, that was the feeling, and it, and it just turned out to be wrong. But the evidence before Milady shows that the scientists, at least in part, were aware by the end of January of the hospitalisation rate of the fact that the, the number of infections was, grossly being, uh, was being grossly underestimated, that there was self-sustaining human-to-human transmission. They were aware by the beginning of February that there was no effective test, trace, control, isolate system in the United Kingdom. So once the virus spread beyond China and became self-sustaining, there was no effective means of stopping its entry into the United Kingdom. That was all known to the scientists at least by the beginning of February. Why wasn't it known to the... Well, on the test trace... To ministers. On the test trace and isolate, on the whole uh, diagnostics question, I think if you, if you look at the evidence, you can see actually that we, we were being assured, I was being assured, that uh, we were in a good uh, place on that until it, you know, it became clear that that, that wasn't quite right. Um, so... But so I'm asking we, you about the system, forgive me, I'm asking you about the system. If the scientists knew and had the data from which the government could draw the proper conclusions, why didn't the government systemically I think rise the, up in, in, in light well, of these alarm bells and do so, something? Well, I, don't, I don't wish to, to say that we were oblivious, because we weren't. And uh, actually, the, a lot of work went on, a lot of, uh, a lot of planning, a, a huge amount of discussion. Uh, so I think... Um, you know, I'm talking quite a lot now to... So I think the CMO first briefed me about it on about the 4th of, of February, um, and we, we talk about uh, what could happen. Uh, SAGE, as you say, is, is meeting. Uh, it's not as though nothing is happening. No. I think that what is, what is, what is going wrong, possibly, is that um, we are just underestimating the the pace the contagiousness of the of the disease and um, you know you can, you can see very clearly from the, the that crucial moment of transition on the from the 12th to the 13th of, of March how radically the the scientific appreciation of the situation changed I'm, I'm Sage asking, on one day was... Forgive me, Mr. I'm, sorry, I'm, I'm asking about January and February. We're, we haven't got to March yet. When did you first become aware that the test and trace system 
whilst extremely efficient in practice, could not be extended beyond the first few hundred cases, that it was a system designed for high, um, yes. high consequence infectious diseases. It dealt with travelers, it dealt with index cases, but it couldn't really be expanded beyond 10 or 20 index cases and five or 600 contacts. Yes, you're going to have to forgive me, Ms. Ms. I, I can't remember exactly when uh, I, it became obvious that uh, test and trace wasn't going to work, but, but there, came, there came a point quite early on when I think Chris or, or, or Patrick said, look, you know, well, test and trace isn't relevant anymore because of the, the spread of the disease. I, from which I, couldn't, you then, I, couldn't, I couldn't date that. From which you then, of course, appreciated that if the virus spread outside China and was self-sustaining, and it had already... Yes, of course, I'm sorry, that was probably much later in March. All right, you think that was later in March? I think so, but I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't swear to it. There was a box note on the 30th of January, 136734. This is an email from, um, from a member of uh, your office, Mr Johnson, um, to... Um, post the private office support team. Grateful if you could include the below in the box tonight. Prime Minister, to be aware the Chinese government granted the permission for the flight to evacuate British nationals from Wuhan, so we're concerned here with repatriation. If we then go over the page, oh, there's a reference the WHO expected to declare a public health emergency of international concern. And then also to be aware, the FCO is drawing down non-official stuff across the network in China. The day before, on the 29th of January, there was a COBRA, 56226. You weren't, of course, at that COBRA, Mr Johnson. You've explained how you, you, you didn't chair a COBRA until March. If we look at page five, we will see that the chair, Mr Hancock, hears from the CMO and Public Health England about the fatalities in China. There was evidence of human-to-human -human transmission, and Germany had four confirmed cases. And then at paragraph three, the CMO said the UK planning assumption were based on the reasonable worst-case scenario. There were two scenarios to be considered. The first was that the spread was confined within China, the second was that the spread was not limited to China, and there would be a pandemic-like scenario with the UK impacted. The second scenario was plausible, but it may take weeks to months. The CMO sets out there in COBRA, and my lady's heard evidence on this, that it was understood that if the second scenario came to pass, there would be a pandemic, because once control had been lost, a viral wave was inevitable. Yes. This is a COBRA that takes place on that day, the... 29th of January. The following day, you receive a box note, which appears to be solely concerned with repatriation. The question is, why were you, the Prime Minister, not being told directly, this is a virus which, if it escapes China, will result in a pandemic? There is information already that it has a very serious fatality rate and a very serious hospitalisation rate. Why was that basic light bulb information not brought to your attention so that you could see the true nature of this emerging crisis? Uh, I, I think that I, I can't give you the exact reason why, why that, uh, was the, that COBRA um, was not brought to my attention, or that, that detail of the COBRA was not brought to my attention. But I can, I can say uh, that at that stage, I think that even the concept of a pandemic did not necessarily imply to the Whitehall mind the kind of utter disaster that COVID was to become. And if I, if I, if I, if I may, and that may sound odd, but what I'm trying to say is that I think people were still operating in the, in the they were still thinking about things like a, a flu, an influenza pandemic, or, or some of the other diseases that I've mentioned. Well, this material, along with a plethora of other documents, shows that the reasonable worst-case scenario was already being envisaged, and that was a reasonable worst-case scenario which denoted deaths to the tune of 800,000 people. So it couldn't have been unknown to Whitehall, 
But you say the no, eventuality I, right, well, was not a, aware. It, it, I, I didn't see that figure, and I, mean, I, saw, I saw a different figure, I think, to, towards the end of, of February, uh, by which time uh, our, our, you know, our alarm was really, you know, really truly, truly raised. Um, but I'm trying to give you my best explanation for, for why people were in the mindset that they, they were in. Um, there was a cabinet on the 31st of January, 56125. If we go to page 10, please, we, we can see the, the nature of the debate. It was, of course, chaired by, by you that afternoon. And the Secretary of State for Health and Social Care, Mr Hancock, says two cases have been confirmed in the United Kingdom. They, they had been, of course, confirmed on the 30th and the 31st of January. It was a very serious problem in China, a large number of cases and fatalities. <coughs> and then the debate moves on to the uh, typical infection rate of two and a half yes. to three people and the mortality rate at 2%. Yes. So if the reproduction value is, is two and a half to three, that is to say one person will infect two to two and a half to three people in an unimmunized population, and the mortality rate, 2% of people who were infected or perhaps confirmed cases, it's not clear, means a very, very large number of people will die. Correct? That's right. The debate in Cabinet, page 10 and 11, deals with repatriation. The Department for International Development examines developing countries where the risk of spread of the disease was high. Spread of the disease globally would be a big problem for those countries and could also mean further evacuation of British nationals. So the debate focuses almost exclusively around the position abroad, the repatriation issue, and despite the reference to the mortality rate, the reproduction figure, and the knowledge which was already in the possession of government that there was confirmed cases outside China with sustained human-to-human -human transmission, nobody stopped to say this means inevitably a huge number of deaths, a wall of death, and this country if it escapes China being overrun by the virus? Yes, I think the word ine inevitably there is, is the one that uh, I would pick up on, because I think if you look at what the, what the Secretary of State for Health told the Cabinet, uh, he said if the, if the China, Chinese uh, grip it, then it won't be a problem. Uh, but if China don't grip it, uh, then that, that could be very serious. But you, your point is still basically... a a good one, which is that, you know, we had to think about what happened if China didn't grip it. And I think we, we just have to, uh, you know, put our hands up here and say, look, I, I think because of the, the absence of collective memory, uh, because we were operating under a different set of assumptions, I, do, I, I, do, I don't think that we were able to comprehend the, the implications of what we were actually looking at. And I think that, oh, sorry, let me put it a, a different way. I think if we, uh, as I said right at the beginning, if we had collectively stopped to think about the uh, mathematical implications of some of the forecasts that were being made, and we, we believed them, um, we might have operated differently. The, 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 the problem was that I don't think we attached enough credence to those forecasts. And because of the experience that we'd had with other zoonotic uh, diseases, I think collectively in, uh, in Whitehall, uh, there was not a sufficient a loud enough klaxon of alarm. I don't blame people, I just think it was because of the experience that they'd had all their lives. The material, Mr Johnson, shows how at various stages you warned against overreaction. You made the point that SARS and MERS had not turned out to be as serious for the United Kingdom as some had feared at the time. BSE 
had not resulted in the levels of deaths which some had forecast. So may we take it that you put yourself in that category I, of people I was, who had I was, I was insufficient agnostic. credence? I was agnostic. Um, I, yeah, I, 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 I thought, I took what Matt had to say very seriously. Um, I, I, th I thought he wasn't you know, badgering me without a, a reason. Um, but on the other hand, I'd had the experience that, that, that you describe. So I was waiting to, waiting for the advice and waiting for that to, to change. In your statement, you say, looking back, it is clear, and this is in the context of January, it's clear that we vastly underestimated the risks in those early weeks. If we'd properly understood how fast COVID was spreading and the fact that it was spreading asymptomatically, there are many things we would have done differently. So first, it was nevertheless clear that COVID was spreading because you knew that it had spread outside China to Thailand, South Korea, Japan. And there is material or a growing understanding that it can be transmitted asymptomatically. But what things well, many... Th now. There was a dawning realisation, Mr Johnson. The material shows, for example, nerve tag on the 14th of February, scientific reports to SAGE in the first week of February, Diamond Princess, and so on and so forth throughout the middle of February. So it was clear it was asymptomatic. But, but what are the many things that you would have done differently had you, as you say, properly understood the true nature of the crisis? Well, could, could I just come back on the asymptomatic Please. quickly? Uh, because I do think it's important. Um, the information that I was getting, and I think, you know, the, this went up right till the, the middle of March, um, was that uh, you were unlikely to have COVID unless you had uh, the symptoms. And I think I, think I had, had that from the health secretary. You did. At a cabinet meeting, you right. were told that okay. by the health secretary. So, so there seemed to be a great deal of, of doubt. That, you know, I mean, I'm sure you're right in what you say about the, the evidence that, that uh, was, being, was knocking around about asymptomatic uh, transmission. And, and infection. Um, I think if, if we'd known or, 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 and fully understood, to answer your question, uh, the speed of, of transmission and, and the, uh, the, the infection fatality rate, um, case fatality rate, I think clearly we, we would have acted immediately to accelerate test and trace to to uh, to, to we would put huge quantities of uh, time and effort into, into, uh, into uh, money into diagnostics um, into PPE uh, into all the things that we were we were going to to need I, I, I'm not saying that work didn't didn't begin it did begin but I think the the the, the panic level would have been would have been much higher I'm trying to explain as honestly as I as I can why I think that panic level wasn't sufficiently high. Let me make plain, the reason I put the question to you in terms, and the way I, that I did in relation to asymptomatic spread is that your own statement says it was not known. If we had properly understood the fact that it was spreading asymptomatically, then there are many things we would have done differently. Yes, so, sorry, I should say... You didn't know. You've explained that you didn't know it was spreading asymptomatically, but my suggestion to you is important parts of the government knew by mid-February, that it was spreading asymptomatically and that there was therefore a governmental failure to act on that information in the way that you have very eloquently described. Well, I, I can't comment on that because I don't know, you know what people thought about the issue of, of asymptomatic transmission in, in February. I do remember what we were being told. I do remember the view around the Cabinet table. I mean, the one thing that has troubled me a lot, I'm sure we'll come on to it, uh, is the, the March discharge policy, where clearly the uh, question of asymptomatic uh, transmission would come, be relevant. I'm so sorry to interrupt. Can we come back to course. that? It, it, there's an important contextual pos position which has to be set out for the purposes of that debate. Um, there is evidence before the inquiry that the chief medical officer told Mr Hancock at a meeting on the 28th of January, that there was credible evidence of asymptomatic transmission within Germany. Was that a fact of which you were aware? 
Uh, of, of Did you that, know that? No, of, of, of uh, that CMOs... Mr Hancock had been told there was credible evidence of asymptomatic transmission within Germany at a meeting on the 28th of January. Well, if I, if I was told that, I've completely uh, forgotten it. My, my, my memory of asymptomatic... The asymptomatic transmission issue is, is as I've, I've told you. Uh, well, you, Mr Hancock, was told. Sorry, Mr. Johnson, Mr. No, sorry, I'm sorry, I understand, uh, uh, my, my lady. What I meant was, if I knew that Chris had told Matt that at some stage, yeah, it's completely gone from my mind. What I remember about asymptomatic transmission is that we, the, the, in, so, in so far as I paid attention uh, to it, uh, it was that it was not thought to be taking place. Borders. Your statement states that the advice that you got consistently from the CMO, the government chief scientific advisor and SAGE, was that <coughs> closing the borders wouldn't work. If you close them dramatically or stringently, then, of course, there are very real, well, intensely difficult practical consequences. And if you just have screening or light touch restrictions, then they may achieve very little. Um, Will you just explain how you received that advice, in fact, consistently from a COBRA or the time of a COBRA on the 5th of February through a cabinet meeting on the 14th of February and through to the end of February? It was consistent advice that you received. Yes, thank you. And it, w w that is one of the most fascinating things about the scientific advice during this uh, pandemic and the, the, the view about behaviours. Many, many things changed, as, I, as, as, as I've said. About, you know, masks, other MPIs were thought they, they moved up and down in, in, in uh, the value that people put on them. Um, <clears throat> but when it came to borders, there was an overwhelming scientific consensus, as far as I understood it, that trying to interrupt the virus uh, with tougher border controls had bought you really very little. Uh, you might delay by a matter of days or perhaps weeks, but you would not stop the virus from entering the UK. And I think that was, uh, I think a lot of people in the country found that very hard to understand, because I think intuitively, we think, if you just stop this thing coming in, and it, it, it was very important for me to try to understand that point and to, to try to explain it to the public, because the public, I think, really believe instinctively that you can fix this with tough border control, or often do. And it's a, it's, a, it's a difficult point sometimes to get over. Mr Cummings says in his statement that you asked rhetorically, aren't people going to think we're mad for not closing the borders? Well, I, I may well have said something like that, but I, I think that the... the um, I think it was a question that people, mm. people were raised. asking. He also says, Mr Johnson, that... Um, because of your general attitude that COVID was like swine flu, you weren't particularly inclined to challenge the scientific advice at all to the effect that borders would make, border restrictions would make no difference. Is that true? Well, um, the, the two statements seem to me to be inconsistent. Well, is it uh, just, is it true or not? Uh, well, uh, I certainly thought it was, I thought it was a, a point worth picking up with the scientists. I wanted to understand the reason why um, border controls di didn't work. But I, in retrospect, you can see that they were right. Countries that did try to, to use borders as a, uh, a way of containing COVID really didn't succeed in that. So did you pick the point up? You say, I think it was a point worth picking up with the scientists. Did, did you push back in any way with the scientists and say, can that be right? Is there not anything that can be done to at least restrict the spread of the virus now that it's left China? I, I, I certainly remember many conversations about uh, borders, quite how adversarial I was, I couldn't, I couldn't not tell you. All right. There was a stock take meeting on the 4th of February, 146558, when, um, in, in the context, Mr Johnson, of, of a general debate about the DHSC, hence the description stock take meeting, um, the chief medical officer gave uh, an update um, following an update from the CMO, the Prime Minister stressed the need to continue to explain our stance to maintain public confidence in the plan. On further travel restrictions, your Secretary of State was engaging foreign Commonwealth Office and European colleagues and would revert with a proposal.
According to the Permanent Secretary, Sir Chris Wormald, Mr Johnson, and to notes kept by Imran Shafi, your Private Secretary of this uh, meeting, you, you were in listening mode. That There was a discussion about possible fatality numbers. Um, but you expressed scepticism about those figures, the fatality numbers, and you noted, they say, that high fatality figures have been given for BSE, bovine spongiform encephalitis, and swine flu. Is that right, that you expressed scepticism about the possible number of deaths? I, I don't remember that, but I, I do remember... Um, I certainly remember the, 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 the BSE... Um, scare, and I, I remember um, the, the immense destruction that that did to the agricultural sector in, in this country, um, and, you know, the, the, the way that all, that all turned out. Um, I think, you know, it would, be, it would be fair to say that I was, uh, I wanted to probe them on their forecasts and to try to understand you know, the basis on which they were making them. You've described how the Whitehall system, the, the, the process of government in Whitehall, failed to have a, a light bulb moment and appreciate the seriousness of, of, of the position. Would you accept that being informed about the f possible fatality numbers but expressing scepticism and drawing a false analogy, as it turned out, with BSE, w was a lost opportunity on your part to drive the system further forward with, with rather more urgency? Well, than appears to be the I, case. I, I, look, I, 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 certainly, I certainly would accept that uh, my mindset, like the mindset of, I think, the overwhelming majority of, of the ministers and officials in, in Whitehall, in, in, that, in that period, uh, Jan to, to mid-Feb, was, was not um, as alarmed as we as we should have been. That's, I, that, I, that's definitely right. 236371, page 37, Mr Cummings sends a text to what was called a number 10 action group. It's dated the 6th of February, so it's, it's early in February. We know that you were party to this WhatsApp group because your name appears at the bottom, Mr Johnson. Dominic Cummings, we need a briefing on corona tomorrow. Chief scientist told me today it's probably out of control now and will sweep the yep. world. Will be major comms exercise. That, Mr. That, um, Sir Edward Lister then refers to the Cobra meeting, which was clear that China is probably losing it. And once it reaches us, not if it reaches us, once it reaches us, it will not peak for three months. Dom is right, the comms is key. And then you say, yes, please, need to talk coronavirus comms at nine. Now, Putting aside the issue of whether or not what you said about the mindset of government applied to Mr Cummings or the chief scientist who refer there to probably out of control now and will sweep world, why was there a focus by way of the singular response to that information on comms? Why didn't any of you say, well, if this virus is probably out of control now and will sweep the world, bearing in mind the fatality numbers, the IFR, the hospitalisation rate, why did none of you say, we need to take steps now to deal with infection control, prevent the spread, alert the population, we have a major problem, not focusing on communications? Because I think that the... Um, <laughs> your, it's your, it's your, your point about the infection rate, fatality rate, uh, the the consequences. I think that when you read that a, an Asiatic pandemic is, is about to, to sweep the world, uh, you, you, you're, you, in, you think you've heard it before. And that was the, that was the problem. And uh, I, so I say we need, to, we need to talk about it, but I think it would be fair to say that the, the, the scientific community within Whitehall at that stage uh, was not telling us that I was not being informed that this was something that was going to um, uh, require urgent and immediate action. But and, you knew... And I think that... Um, I think that... The, the, although although you're, you're right that we could, 
we could see the mathematical implications of the reasonable worth case scenario, I think the problem was that we didn't think, and this was our mistake, we didn't think that the RWCS was very likely to happen. That well, was the problem. We'll come to that. So when I get told, anyway, forgive me. But BSE did not have a 2% fatality rate. Swine flu did not have a 2% fatality rate. So when you say there was an institutional failure to realize the seriousness of the position because of Asiatic, prior Asiatic epidemics, or because of BSE or swine flu, the difference was, and it was known to government, was that COVID had a 2% fatality rate, and BSE and swine flu had not. Uh, uh, that is entirely correct. Uh, uh, but I, I think the, 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 the tragedy is that we were operating, as I said in my statement, on a fallacious inductive logic about previous uh, reasonable worst case scenarios and and this one. And we just, this was the, this was the one uh, where I'm afraid the worst predictions turned out to be, or almost the worst predictions turned out to be correct. 56137 is a cabinet meeting on the 6th of February, which you of course chaired. Um, on page six, so that um, the public can understand, Mr. Johnson, that this document, which is um, minutes of the whole cabinet meeting, has large parts redacted as being sensitive and irrelevant because, of course, Cabinet dealt with many other issues other than just coronavirus. But on this page, page six, Cabinet turns to update on coronavirus. It's very serious. Official estimate was around 28,000 cases, but that's likely to be a significant underestimate. The virus didn't appear to have been contained in Wuhan. The mortality rate was only around 2%. Um, there is a reference to a ministerial exercise um, on this page. So, so what, date, what date is this, Cabinet? Uh, this is the, 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 the 6th of February. There we are. There will be a tabletop exercise the following week. What was your understanding of that tabletop exercise? Did you attend I, I didn't, it? I didn't. Did you have any role in that I, at I, all? Did, I didn't attend it, and I'm sure my officials did. All right. And then just three lines above it, the central point to make was that the government had a plan to deal with this illness, and this was guided by science. Did you ask in the course of that cabinet meeting, what, bluntly, is the plan? Uh, I understood the plan to be uh, from um, uh, what Matt had said and uh, from the discussions I, I had had, that we would uh, try to isolate, test, and, and, and trace people as they as they arrived. Uh, that was what I thought the uh, the, the plan was, and, I, and my my impression was that we had a good testing system. But I, I don't. To answer your question directly, I I I'm, I'm I can't be confident. I said in that meeting, uh, what is the uh, what is the plan? But that, my, that is my understanding of what it was. A week later, on the 14th of February, Mr. Johnson, there's another cabinet meeting. And another update, 56138, page one, we see the attendees, page six, the update on coronavirus. The Prime Minister said the government and the country needed to be ready for the coronavirus situation to get worse. The public messaging so far had struck the right balance between preparing the public for what might happen and not causing unnecessary alarm. Your focus there, Mr Johnson, appears to be on messaging, on communications, on ensuring that the public are aware but they're, they're not um, caused undue alarm by an overreaction. Where was the debate uh, at your urging about infection control measures, the practicalities, the nuts and bolts of stopping the virus from spreading irrevocably throughout the United Kingdom now it had left China? Well, I, I, I'm not certain that the... So, first of all, on messaging, uh, the messaging was incredibly important. Messaging, in the end, was the, the most important tool we had to, to deal with the, the virus. I, I, don't wish to, I don't think we should deprecate the importance of messaging. Um, as for 
measures to, to tackle infection, spread of infection uh, within the, the country. We've, we've talked about borders and we've talked about tests and trace. Uh, borders didn't really offer a, a, a panacea. Uh, tests and trace, we were um, sadly not as well prepared as we should have been. So the borders were never going to work. The test and trace couldn't work because it was only for a handful of cases. You've identified no other practical means at the disposal of government to prevent the spread of the virus. Why doesn't somebody say, we have a major problem here? Not only is it coming, but the two measures which you've just identified aren't going to work because and will for the never reason, work. Because for the reason I've, I've given you, which is that uh, we, although we can see the, the RWCS and we're seeing these numbers, we are not yet believing, perhaps irrationally, but we're not yet believing that um, the, the RWC or, or anything like it is going to happen. And that's, that's fundamentally the problem. Page seven, there's another reference to the government's plans. There were plans in place Top of the page, concluding the government's chief medical officer said that if the virus became widespread in the United Kingdom, widespread in the United Kingdom, there were plans in place. When the chief medical officer told you that, what did you make of it, bearing in mind that if the virus was widespread, it would necessarily have extended beyond the limited test and trace system about which you were beginning to understand something, and the borders have obviously failed. What were the plans, did you think? Um, I think that he's referring there to... Uh, to testing and, and tracing, but plainly that was, uh, that was in, inadequate. Um, at a certain stage later in the, in the month, as I, as I think I say in my statement, Chris did brief me about M NPIs, about, uh, about lockdowns and, and other, measure, other measures. Indeed. Um, on page eight, you sum up the meeting, Mr Johnson. You're grateful to the Secretary of State for Health. It was challenging to convince people... Uh, Grateful to the Secretary of State for Health and Social Care and his department for their work, and in particular for getting the balance of communications right. There was potential for the virus to have a large impact on the UK's economy. Was it because of the mindset to which you have referred the inquiry that you didn't say there is potential for this virus, indeed a probability now, that it will kill rather than focusing on the economy? Because, I, and I didn't say that, because, I, because you, you use the word probability... Uh, in the sense of, I suppose, I mean, you know, uh, overwhelming likelihood. Uh, I, I, that was not what we thought, or not what I thought, certainly. All right. Um, but I did think that we were now in a situation, almost certainly, uh, where uh, we were going to have to take a lot of measures to contain it uh, that would um, be costly and, uh, and difficult. So that's, that's the point I... And if, and if you think about it, that's... That was my uh, BSC. You're notwithstanding your excellent point that it it, it wasn't uh, nearly as fatal as as people had originally said. Uh, it costs a, a, an awful lot of money. Cobra on the 18th of February was not a meeting that that you were present at. But um, if we could just have up five six two two seven um, in in broad outline. Mr Johnson, and we can see this, I think, from page seven, the director of the Civil Contingency Secretariat says to Mr Hancock, who chaired the meeting, paragraph seven, there was work to be done to create a clear plan of activity. Um, I, I, it's not appropriate for me to ask you what was meant by that phrase. Sorry, this is, this is, this is Matt speaking, is it? Uh, no, that's the... the um, if it's paragraph 17... On page seven, the chair invited the director of the Civil Contingency Secretariat. This yeah. is her responding. Yeah. Um, this is Catherine Hammond. Indeed. Were you aware, um, as Mr Hancock has acknowledged and has told the inquiry, by this date, the 18th of February, that, quote, there was no rule book, the system had to build many parts of the response from scratch, and that there was no central government plan other than the old 2011 pan flu strategy. Um, Were you told that? I, I was not told that, um, but that became apparent as, as uh, the days went on. 
and clearly one of the things I hope in this inquiry is that we, we will have uh, a much better uh, system of planning for these, these types of events. 146563 is an email chain between your private secretary, Imran Shafi, the government's chief scientific advisor, Sir Chris Whitty, and Catherine Hammond concerning the coronavirus in Italy. And to get your chronological bearings, on the 21st of February, so three days before, Mr Johnson, 11 municipalities in Italy, yeah. you'll recall, had locked down the, the, the population That's of right. those municipalities. And, and also, I should say, the, the, the Diamond Princess affair, that is to say the explosive outbreak of the virus on that cruise ship, had become apparent, as had the figures of the number of people who showed no symptoms on that boat. But to turn to the, the document itself, um, your private secretary says it's, it would be good to see where we get to post-SAGE tomorrow. At some point soon, I'd like to start exposing the Prime Minister to the potential decisions he might have to take in short order on this. At that moment, it's been fairly abstract with him, I think. Now, plainly, Mr Johnson, you can't go digging around in other people's emails or in government systems to find out for yourself what's happening. You have to be reliant upon on what you're told. What was your general state of information, the general level of knowledge at this date, now in, in, in the dog days of February? OK, so, so by the... I mean, my memory now is that I think the, I, the scenes from Italy really rattled me. And um, it was... I thought... Uh, I, and I remember seeing a, a note somewhere saying that eight, you know, the fatality rate in Italy was 8%. Uh, uh, because they had an elderly population, I thought, well, my God, we've got an elderly population. This is this is appalling. And this can't be. This can't, and I thought this, my instinct was this cannot possibly be be right. Mm. You know, th this 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 number, um, and um, I mean, you know, just so you know, I, I I look at all this stuff in which we seem so oblivious with that, with with horror now. I mean, we 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 should have we should have have twigged. We should collectively have twigged. Uh, much sooner. I should have tweaked. Um, I think what Imran is trying to do here is to get the scientists to take me through the, MP the idea of the MPIs and, and what that would involve. This is the, the 24th. There'd been a COBRA on the Tuesday before, the 18th of February. There wasn't a COBRA, in fact, again until the 26th of February. Um, this was just on the cusp of half term. There was no cabinet between Friday the 14th of February and Tuesday the 25th of February, but SAGE and Nerve Tag continued to convene. Um, despite being, as you've said it yourself, seriously rattled by the news of Italy, did the tempo of work on coronavirus nevertheless dip during the half-term break that followed? Um, I, I, I noticed that, you, you know, you've, you've been over that period in your, in your previous um, interrogations in, your, in, in this in, inquiry, and I hope um, the, the inquiry, you know, is satisfied that actually there wasn't a long holiday that I took in that. And uh, you personally, you, well, and, well, well, let and, me ask uh, you. Because I, I think that there was some misapprehension. Uh, you you carried on working because I you did. returned and I, to And Dan, for instance, on the, on the 18th... If, 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 you just, oh, if you'll allow me to set out the picture, Mr Johnson, yes, it please. may make things a bit easier. It, you returned to Downing Street three times, I think, during that yes. half-term break from Chevening, where you were. You weren't at Chequers. You received a number of notes in your red box. You didn't, though, receive a daily update, I think, dealing with coronavirus expressly or exclusively until your return from the half-term break on Monday the 24th of February. And the question to you is, in the box returns, the box notes that you did receive... What proportion focused on coronavirus? Well, I, I can tell. I, I, I can't tell you that. I can't because I can't remember. But I remember there were, there were certainly conversations going on um, about COVID uh, with my officials. And uh, in that very period, I rang uh, President Xi of China uh, to uh, offer uh, the uh, our the UK's uh, condolences for what was happening in China to discuss. Uh, the origins of uh, of COVID, 
uh, and uh, to, to compare notes on what uh, was happening. I, I also, uh, I think a couple of days later, I rang President Trump uh, in America uh, to, to discuss exactly the same thing. Uh, so it was, a, it was uh, despite what has previously been said uh, to, to the, um, the inquiry by, by some, uh, some of the evidence, uh, there was a lot going on. And it, it really starts to, to mount in tempo uh, around about the time that you, we get um, Catherine Hammond's note of the... On the 28th. The 28th, of February. 28th yes. So the question to you, Mr Johnson, is this, and... and Nobody is suggesting you put your feet up at, at evening during that week. Well, apart but, from you, that is. Well, I, I'm, what I'm suggesting to you is, by your very own reference, the fact that tempo increased after the half-term break, between the 14th of February, when Cabinet discussed the plans that would need to be drawn up, to the 25th of February, after half-term, yep. relatively little overall was done in terms of responding to this immediate crisis. Was that? I think that the... the sorry, forgive me, I was... Ms. I was referring to a, a, a conversation I happened to catch on the on the between you and a previous witness, in which I, I thought the impression was being given by somebody that I was I was relaxing during that period. I, was, I think it was Mr. Cummings. It may have been, and not uh, given by me, Mr. I Johnson. Forget, but I, by the I, I take it back unreservedly, Ms. Keith, and I I I, 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 uh, I, I was working throughout the the, the period, and the um, the tempo did increase, particularly. Uh, during, a, you know, uh, when we got the, when, when I saw the message from, from Catherine Hammond on, I, I, I think it was the 2nd of March, but it's, I'm told it was earlier. But there was uh, a meeting on, on the Friday, the 28th of February that you attended that's right. with the CCS. That's right. And what, what troubled me was the sheer number of, um, of, of potential fatalities under the, under the RWCS. And this was uh, just a horrifying figure. And I, I couldn't believe it. I've got to be honest with you. I thought this... this because because um, what the paper also said was uh, it may be a, 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 like a bad flu pandemic or it may be milder than that. And I thought, well... We have plenty of bad flu pandemics in the UK, and we also have, and if it's milder than that, then it, it won't be an exceptional thing at all. So why, are we, why am I also being told that the RWCS is 520,000? Well, that was, of course, a meeting on the 28th of February, but I, I want you, please, to, to answer the question about the tempo of work on coronavirus between the 14th of February and the 28th of February when that paper was produced to you. Would you accept that there was a lost opportunity on the part of government to react with sufficient speed and attention to the nature of this crisis in that two-week period? For whatever reason, because of the mindset, because parts of government were away, it matters not. Overall, the government took its eye off the ball in that two-week period by failing to act sufficiently speedily. I, th I think that... There were clearly things that we could have done if we'd, and, and, and should have done, if we'd known and understood quite how fast it was spreading. But we, we didn't. All right. And, and that, was the, that was the reality. There's a COBRA on Wednesday, the 26th of February, 56216, page six. This is a, a crucial moment, although it's not, again, a, a COBRA that you were present at. Mr Johnson, but it is a, a cobra of the utmost seriousness because uh, on page 11, the chair, Mr Hancock, said the reasonable worst-case planning assumptions looked close to becoming the reasonable planning assumptions as cases in Italy demonstrated the need for heightened alertness. Um, turning that into plain English, what Mr Hancock was saying was that the government which had hitherto been working on the basis of planning for a reasonable worst-case scenario, planning for the worst but hoping for a better outcome, had realised that the reality of the scenario identified by Sir Chris Whitty in January, the second scenario, was looking close to becoming 
the reality. That is to say, the reasonable worst case scenario was indeed coming to pass. Not, not there quite yet, but it was looking close. Would you agree that that understanding was a crucial moment? Sorry, the, uh, what date is this? This is the 26th of February. It's a COBRA you weren't present at, and it's in advance of the receipt by you of the civil contingencies paper. That, that, it, it does look as though um, that meeting informed Catherine Hammond's, or helped to inform Catherine Hammond's uh, paper, and, and, and perhaps was the reason why I was I, I got the uh, had the meeting I did. But I, I, I couldn't swear to that. I, I haven't asked you that, in fact, but but it may well be as a matter for my lady. The material shows that the CCS were tasked to provide the paper for you before I'm this, sorry, the, this meeting. Okay. But the question from this paragraph for you is. As the Prime Minister, were you told that the COBRA, which you had not shared, had been told that the reasonable worst case scenario no, was I looking close to becoming the reality? I, I, I don't remember that. I okay. don't remember that. The CCS paper, 28th of February, is 182331. The first paragraph, Ms. Hammond says, COVID-19 looks increasingly likely to become a global pandemic although this is not yet certain. It's the first sentence of this report. Did you ask, Ms Hammond, how can it not yet be certain when the virus has escaped China, it's sustained, there is sustained human-to-human -human transmission outside China, there are cases now in the United Kingdom, and we have no means of preventing its spread? Why is she saying it's not yet certain? Um, I think I don't know the answer uh, why she's saying that. I think formally speaking, it had not yet been declared a global pandemic, and I think it was up to uh, Tedros uh, Ghebreyesus at the WHO to do so, and, and maybe she's referring to that. But I read it as meaning um, it's not yet certain to be a, a major problem. Paragraph two. Based on existing assumptions for severe pan flu outbreak, in a reasonable worst case scenario, about half of the UK's population would become ill and up to 520,000 people could die as a direct result of COVID-19. Just pausing there, note the reference to could die as opposed to would die once the virus is, is, um, has self-sustaining community transmission. The scientific advice is to use these numbers for planning. They're not a prediction. Did anybody at that meeting, or the meeting in which you had, and we'll come to the actual meeting itself in a moment, but did anybody at the meeting at which this paper was discussed ask Ms Hammond, why is the sole paper from the Civil Contingency Secretariat, the, the, the crisis management body in the heart of government, suggesting that these figures are not a prediction when, as you've just described, the information to COBRA on the 26th of February was saying the reasonable worst case planning assumption looks close to becoming reality. I can't answer that question. Right. But it's a very good question. Um, page two, paragraph nine. The report says we need to strike a balance between taking precautionary steps and overreacting. As cases spread, the risk of overreacting is reducing. We're now planning for a potential global pandemic that would inevitably spread to the UK. So it would, in this paragraph, inevitably spread. Did you assess, reading this report, Mr Johnson, that the reference to overreaction was long past and, and that in fact, in the striking of that balance, there was now a real emergency and a need to take precautionary steps straight away. I, I think that the... Uh, I found the paper um, very alarming, arresting. I, I went... I think I remember going to talk to my officials about it, uh, saying, um, uh, you know, which is it? A, a, a severe to mild flu pandemic or 
an RWCS of 520,000 because I just I couldn't understand what I was being asked to to anticipate. So I've referred to the meeting. Um, your private secretary, Iman Shafi, refers at 146636 to the meeting. It's, it's difficult to read his writing, but there is a reference to the PM asking, what's the strategy? There we are. Thank you. Prime Minister, what's the strategy? When are we going to take big decisions of what evidence, on what evidence, of what evidence, and then you say biggest damage done by overreaction. So it looks from the face of this note that your, your sense that there was a real crisis, that you were extremely rattled, is, is prevalent in the first sentence. But in the second sentence, perhaps in reflection of the CCS report, you say the biggest damage is done by overreaction. I, I, think, I think I'm leaving both possibilities open. Um, because that's how it's, it's still, it still struck me. Um, I think th that in, in disasters such as this, the, the, the actions that government take inevitably also have, have costs, and, and I'm sure we're going to come on to this, but that, that's the balance you have to strike. As the Prime Minister, instead of directing government to respond to the threat of a, a near existential crisis, you instead warned of the dangers of overreaction. No, I say, no, 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 that's, well, forgive me. Um, I say, when are we going to take some decisions and on what evidence? Because I, I, I'm, I'm looking at a problem that's been presented to me. Um, I need to know what the plan is going to be. I, I've told you that. I don't like the look of the way it's going in Italy at all. And we need to do something. And that is the day, I think, the, the 28th, when I remember, though I, I'm not sure if Chris would confirm this, I remember having a long conversation with him at some stage around that date uh, when he, he takes me through uh, MPIs, what we, we later refer to as lockdowns, and he, and he tells me about the, the pros and cons uh, about, he gives a, uh, a sketch of the behavioural fatigue argument, and uh, he takes me through the through the issues. So I'm so I I think what I'm saying is well, if this is the problem, then when when am I going to be given a menu of options about about what we're going to do about this? The readout from the meeting, one three six seven five zero, shows that you called for a, a, a major ramp up of OGD, other, other government department activity or on domestic preparedness. Um, and that was the, the least we, we could do. Yes, if you just go um, over to the, I think the second page. Oh no, there we are, it's the top of the page. Thank you, I missed it. Um, we need a major ramp up of OGD activity on domestic preparedness. We should use the COBRA meeting to land this point with the Secretaries of State. The Prime Minister agreed with the approach to publish an action plan. That's the plan that was published on the 3rd of March, was it not? Contain, um, delay. He'll review the plan itself over the weekend. You read the draft plan over that weekend, did you not? The um, 29th and 30th first, of February. The first plan, yeah. Um, 28th of February and the 1st of March. And you agreed to the need for early emergency legislation, and then there's a debate about um, repatriation. Do you, with hindsight, and I emphasize hindsight, Mr. Johnson, accept that the, the, the level of seriousness may not have been sufficiently communicated in this direction from you? Um, Do you say you did enough? I, I think that I, I did what I could. I think the, the problem is that Actually, if you exclude borders and test and trace is not um, as, as good as it cracked up to be, um, and if you're told that we've got ample supplies of PPE, um, I was finding it hard to conceptualise exactly what we should be doing except for the MPIs. And that was the only thing that I'd been 
I'd been given. And we had, we had no plan for that. And I don't think the concept of lockdown, or, the, or the, even the word lockdown, had yet emerged. Indeed not. There was a 25th of February SAGE meeting where non-pharmaceutical interventions were debated, but they didn't include lockdown. There was a debate about yeah. extreme social distancing in the beginning of March. Lockdown doesn't appear to later. It doesn't. But your answer, Mr Johnson, is I think the problem is that if you exclude borders and test and trace, uh, it's not as good as it's cracked out to be. And if you're told we've got ample supplies of PPE, I was finding it hard to conceptualise exactly what we should be doing. That debate, that realisation on your part that there is no effective border control, the PPE may be deficient, that there is no effective test and trace, scaled up test and trace, isolate contact system, is absent from all this material. That debate simply doesn't take place. There is no general realisation the virus is coming, it's a 2% fatality rate or 1% yes, fatality rate. And we haven't got the measures in place to be able to deal with it. That debate doesn't take place. And I think that's, and I think that's right. And I, I think it's basically for the same reason that I've given, which is that although people intellectually can see that the RWCS could happen, uh, 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 as Catherine Hammond puts it, they still don't think that it's very likely to happen. Uh, and that's the, the reality. Now, in March on the 2nd, you chaired your first COBRA. Five six two one seven. If we look at page five, paragraph two, we can see that you're told that contact tracing for the source of infection for the last two cases in the United Kingdom had not been successful. So just pausing there, even the limited test and trace system in the United Kingdom had failed to pick up what was still then only relatively few number of cases, it had not picked up the last two, and that in both France and Germany there was now sustained community transmission. So in terms of infection spread, um, it, it, it may be thought, um, uh, well, game over in terms of infection spread. The aim for the delay phase, if contained failed, was to delay the peak of infections to reduce the peak and to minimise loss of life. Um, then in paragraph three, the CMO said that interventions to delay the spread of the virus must not be implemented too early in order to ensure maximum effectiveness. Um, there is material from SPY B, one of the SAGE subcommittees, on the 4th and 9th of March, also COBRA on the 4th of March, and the 9th of March, which demonstrate that the Chief Medical Officer in particular said timing of implementation is crucial, compliance or despondence is heavily dependent on timing. I'm going to use a, the well-known phrase behavioural fatigue, although it has no scientific genesis, you understand the, the, the phrase and its meaning. To what extent were your decisions, and, and we're now getting into the phase of which social distancing uh, measures were, were starting to be contemplated, to what extent we, was your decision-making process influenced by this notion that intervention sh should not be imposed too early? Well, it was the um, prevailing view uh, for a, a, a long time, and it wasn't just the CMO who articulated the concept of behavioural fatigue. If you look at the uh, many other meetings, or look at the press conference of the of the twelfth of of March, you can see that the CSA gives a very full description of uh, of what happens uh, if you go in hard and early with a, a, a population that has no immunity. Um, and then uh, you release the measures 
it bounces back. Or, or I think you've described it, the, 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 the spring. Will you forgive unquote. me if I pause you there, Mr Johnson? I was asking you questions about this idea that the, the population mustn't have measures imposed too early because they will become tired of it. Yes. There is an issue about maximum effectiveness. I wasn't, in fact, asking you about the recoiled or uncoiled uh, spring. Sorry, but the two, uh, forgive me, uh, and you're, you're quite right, but the two things are connected because what the CSA went on to say uh, on the 12th of March was that um, uh, people get fed up and th th that you lose the, so if you have to keep, and we'll come to this, I'm sure, in the matter of the October, uh, November uh, uh, lockdowns, um, you have to keep doing it. And so my anxiety was, in the absence of therapeutics and without a, a vaccination programme, uh, what would happen uh, if we simply went into uh, a, a hard lockdown early and then had no alternative but to come out? And so to, to answer your, your main question, that was a, it was a, a, an anxiety, a, a problem that was very prevalent during those early days. This issue appears to have been raised with you at, at a relatively early stage on the 2nd of March. We must not implement too early in order to ensure maximum effectiveness. To what extent do you think it likely that you would have proceeded to implement measures earlier than you did had you not been told you mustn't go too early to ensure maximum effectiveness? What is the impact of this? What does, should the inquiry make of this debate? Is it important? It's Did it very, make a it's difference? Very, it's, very, it's, it's fundamental. And it's it goes, to, because it's, I'm afraid it's what happened. We have to be realistic about 2020, the whole year, that whole tragic, tragic year. We did lock down, but then it bounced back after we'd unlocked. And, I'm so sorry, Mr. And, may, may I bring you back? Sorry. It's the first week in March. Had you not been told, don't go too early, because there's a limit to which the population will be able to bear the implementation of these measures. I, that's Would you question. have gone earlier than you did, and by what time were you effectively forced to delay? I don't think I can... I can't say that I would have gone earlier, because I think I would have been guided by what advice I was getting about when to put MPIs in. Don't forget that this is a once-in-a-century event. We're doing things, we're, we're enacting policy that has never been enacted in our lifetimes in this country. And to, to do it at the drop of a hat is, is very, it's very logistically difficult, but, but uh, it was you know, not something you, you rushed into. But having been told by the CMO, be careful, don't go too early because the population might not wear it. Did you consider saying to him, well, in this general debate about non-pharmaceutical interventions and social distancing, the public health demands, the, the likelihood of yes. death and hospitalisation demand that we take these measures, regardless of whether the population are prepared to put up with it over time. Did you push back against this this notion I, of don't go too early. I, I, th I thought that the... The short answer is no. I, I don't remember... You, you I, don't, don't. I, don't, I don't... So I don't remember saying to myself, absolutely candidly, I don't remember saying to myself, this is so bad, they must be wrong, I must overrule the scientists, or I must ignore the scientists, I must go... No question of overruling the scientists, so they, you were following the scientists. Correct, forgive me. I, I must ignore... Uh, the the, the uh, that's a very important distinction. I must ignore the scientific advice uh, and the the threats to public health uh, and of worse outcomes if we go too early. And I must simply maximise. I've got to deal with the problem in front of the windscreen. I've got to deal with it now. Um, it, it, I didn't. I didn't do that, and I and. Uh, Perhaps, with hindsight, I should have done. But as I said to you right at the outset of this hearing, I, 
I, I just don't know the answer. No, that, that's clear. Mr Keith, um, is that a convenient moment? But by all means. It's just that we, we usually break every hour and a quarter, and I think that's probably enough this morning. Thank you. Um, 20 to 2, please.
Mr Keith. Mr Johnson, may we start with a WhatsApp message that Mr Cummings sent to Lee Kane. 48313. This is dated the 3rd of March. And Dominic Cummings says he doesn't think it's a big deal and he doesn't think anything can be done and his focus is elsewhere. He thinks it'll be like swine flu and he thinks his main danger is talking economy into a slump. There are a number of parts to that message and I'd just like you please to, to say whether or not you accept that there is any truth in this message bearing in mind it's dated also the 3rd of March, or, or whether you think there is a, a degree of accuracy in it? Well, we've just had the, the previous day, um, uh, Mr Keith, we've just had the, the COBRA that, I, that I've chaired, um, I, I think, um, were, were planning to, to deal with something that I, I actually think, uh, as I've told you, is is starting to be an issue of, of concern to me. Um, I, was, I was, as I say, rattled by the images from Italy. Um, I couldn't figure out um, why I was getting these conflicting messages about whether something could happen, the, the, the scale of the, of the RWCS and uh, what it was going to be. Uh, I think the part of the, the message that is is still correct at that point, is that if, I, if, if, if at that point you had asked me um, what is going to be the, lo the lasting damage from this, um, I still would have probably said it's going to be what we do to, to, to fight it uh, rather than uh, the, the actual impact of the, of the disease, but I was, I was increasingly con concerned about it. You have, in fact, already um, given evidence to the inquiry in relation to why, it's at, at you suggested at an earlier stage, there were comparisons properly to be drawn with swine flu, and you, you've described the importance to you of, uh, of not talking the economy down. The first line, he doesn't think anything can be done. May I just ask you this? This date, the, the 3rd of March, comes, of course, after your meeting with the Civil Contingency Secretariat. It comes after the COBRA, at which there is some early debate about measures and what can be done. And, and if you did say on the 3rd of March to Mr Cummings, I don't think anything can be done, that casts a very significant light upon what you were being told around that time. I don't think... I. I, I... I can't say exactly what I said to um, to my advisor, um, nor, nor would I necessarily place too much reliance on his his reporting of, of of what I said. But I think my my impression was at that time that you know because of what we've said about borders, because of what we said about um, the other measures open to us, um, that. I, uh, it goes back to the to the questions I was asking. You know, I, I I couldn't see yet the plan. I couldn't see what. So, so the NPIs were to me, and this is probably what Imran is getting at in his email. Um, pretty, you know, far fetched still in my imagination. I was. <coughs> I was, still, I was still gestating that. At a press conference on the 3rd of March, you said that we were, as a country, extremely well prepared. Of, of course, as it, as it turns out, um, that was not so. But I want to ask you, the weekend before, you had received the draft action plan, the contained delay document, which you'd been shown in draft form. And, and in that document, there is that assertion. We are well prepared and we have plans in place, etc. Do you think you told the world that we were well prepared on the third because you had seen it in that action plan, the draft of which you've been reading over the weekend? Yes, this is the second, uh, of, this is the weekend of, of the, the 28th, 28th February, 28th, 1st of March. 29th. Was it a leap year? Was it a 29th? I really don't know, Mr. Johnson. I um, can't assist you with that. 
Anyway, um, uh, it's certainly true that um, I was the general the general reassurances I was I, I was getting were that you know we we were well we were well prepared. So the, so the scales had not yet fallen about, for instance, test and trace. Indeed, and you. You shook hands with patients at the Royal Free yes. Hospital on the 1st of March. You, you know that, of course, you were later criticised for that. Um, may we take it that you hadn't seen, or at least you hadn't been advised of the contents of the Spy B paper of around that time. In fact, the paper came later, the 3rd of March, but advice was given generally before that, advising against greetings such as shaking hands. I, did, I, did you know? I... I I didn't, but I, I do think that it was I shouldn't have I shouldn't have done that in retrospect, and um, I should have I should have been more precautionary. Um, but I wanted to, I, I wanted to be encouraging to people, and so I think it's on that day that I go to Collindale um, to the to, to PHE, and al although I've been told, sorry, this is my st in my statement, but although I've been told that um, you know, we have a fantastic belt and braces uh, system. I was, I was a little bit concerned about, um, I had a feeling that perhaps they weren't really as across the situation as, as I've been led to believe. Mr. Hancock gave evidence to the fact that he was told on the 18th of February by Public Health England that the test system was unsustainable that it wouldn't be able to operate beyond the handful of first few hundred cases or first few hundred cases. Did you know that when I, you visited Conondale? No, and I, in fact, I think I gave a clip uh, to, the, to the media, which I, 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 I gave some figure for the number of daily tests that we, or I believed that then that we were doing. And I do remember Chris being a CMO, uh, being you know, quite... Um, sounding confident, at least to me, about the number of, of tests we were capable of, of doing at, at, at around that time. I, 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 now I can't remember the, the exact right. COBRA on the 4th of March, you chaired that. You were presented with a paper, Potential Impact of Behavioural and Social Interventions, 56158. Again, it's illustrative of, of what you were being told at the time, Mr Johnson, because it, it makes plain that Behavioural and social interventions can be applied as part of an HMG response, including the expected impacts. The note doesn't cover economic, operational, policy considerations. SAGE has not provided a recommendation of which interventions or package of interventions the government may choose to apply. So the first question is, did you understand that SAGE was never going to be telling you, <coughs> Mr Johnson, you must do this. It could only ever provide advice about the nature of the interventions and the consequences and the risks and so on. It could never tell you what to do or what you had to consider doing. That's right. I mean, Sage is, Sage is like a, 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 you know, a doctor-patient relationship. The doctor can't order you uh, to do things. The doctor is not responsible for, uh, for what you do. The doctor says... Uh, if you do this, then that. If you do, if you fail to do it, then then the other, mm. and and that's that's basically how it works and, and should work. Was the chief medical officer around that time, the fourth of March, telling you, however, you must now start considering these behavioural and social interventions? And of course, the first one you'll recall it is imposed on the twelfth of March. Yes, but so we don't know when you first started to. So, so, so as, I, as I said um, before the break, actually we'd, the, the CMO and I had had a heart-to-heart -heart about, um, MP, about non-pharmaceutical interventions, about um, a lot of aspects, of it. particularly uh, he, he, from a public health point of view, the, the costs, and he, and he, and he, really, he really stressed that. Um, so we had thought about it. And I could see that that was the direction in which things were starting to go. And it's only a, it's only a few days later when I actually tell the, the public, I think for the first time, I think on the 
think it's the ninth or thereabouts, we're going to have to start ramping. We're going to have to start restricting social contact. And and that, that answers perhaps my next question, which is. Why was there a delay between the first debate between you and the Chief Medical Officer about the possible imposition of these behavioural and social interventions and the 12th of March when the first really significant intervention was imposed? I think there we have to go back to the, the earlier conversation that we yeah. had about... Mindset. Timeliness. No, no, not, not, not time set, but mind... Uh, 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 going uh, early. About, about going early. About... about the 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 issues that were raised by going hard going early which later became the mantra um but which in um in march the 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 problem was that if you I, so i was told repeatedly by by both csa and cmo you know you, you risked bounce back and behavioral fatigue and and, and yet more behavioural fatigue as a consequence of bounce back. There's a graph on page two of this document which shows what the, the waves, that's to say the, the, the transmission of the virus, would be likely to be, depending on whether or not there was mitigation, that's to say intervention, or no mitigation, or moderate, um, um, moderate intervention, and, and you can see the different colours of the gra of the of the lines, Mr. Johnson, depending yeah. on whether or not they were very stringent or less stringent. Um, so it was plain to you, wasn't it, that if no steps were taken, there would be a massive first wave. That's the the, the black wave. But if it was reduced to some extent, there would be moderate transmission, the blue wave, and then a, a more severe intervention would be high tr would be the high transmission reduction. Um, but to make absolutely plain, if we look at page five, there was at this stage on the 4th of March no mention of a lockdown as no. such. There were a range of potential interventions from stopping large events, closure of schools, home isolation, whole household isolation, yes. social distancing, impact. We can see there on the right. All, hand. all these things. But, but no lockdown. No. And, um, all, <coughs> and that's quite right. Um, so this is the sort of the, the, the double hump. Uh, graph that really became very influential in all our thinking, and indeed is what I'm afraid, tragically, is more or less what what happened. Um, but the the measures that we could take to depress the first curve, first wave, uh, were all very much couched in the uh, with caveats about timeliness <laughs> and not going going at the right moment. And, and it's right to say, isn't it, that and so the wording that the Chief Medical Officer used with you and, and spoke in COBRA on the 2nd of March must not be implemented too early was with reference to interventions, plural. Yes, and if I, if I could offer a suggestion as to, you know, what was, what was really going on, I, th I, I think that... And it is clear we we simply didn't realise how fast the disease was spreading. And, and, and the, if you remember, the predictions were that the peak was going to come in uh, mid May or, or June, uh, I think, and it was really well in advance of that. If we go back to page two and the graph, you can see that it's put there in terms of spring, summer, and autumn. Yeah. But um, there was no suggestion on that graph that the peak of the black unmitigated wave would, would be um, the end of March or the beginning of April. Um, That's correct. Speeding up now, because we're, we're, we're coming now to the, the, the final decisions in, in March. WhatsApp messages from Mr. Hancock, uh, or rather um, his WhatsApp group, the WhatsApp group he shared with Mr. Cummings and Mr. Slack, suggests that around this time on the 5th of March... They debate telling you to stop saying business as usual. Mm. Did you recall that debate with them? I, I don't, and nor do I even remember saying that, but uh, using the phrase. Um, but um, I, I think what I might have said is, you know, until such time as we tell you to do X, Y, Z, it's business as usual. But I, I don't, I don't remember that debate. You've described the genesis of the herd immunity debate. 
may I just please show you a WhatsApp uh, entry or WhatsApp communication from the 14th of March, so running forward a bit to the weekend of which there was a distinct change in strategy. Yeah. If we could just look at 14, the 14th of March, 7, 17 a.m., so I think it's page three of 48399, we can see I'm not sure that's the correct document 48399 oh yes it is oh, yes. thank you very much um, so just to put in its context Mr Johnson over the weekend of which there was a change in strategy there, there, were, there were repeated conversations between you all of course but you raise at this point um, the point of the, the the impact of a herd immunity debate. Um, and, and you make the point further down the page, I think it's at 649.39, yeah. um, yes, here's the problem with the herd immunity argument. So just very shortly, you've described to the inquiry how the herd immunity debate arose at the beginning of March, the 5th of March. It appears that you were still debating, or your advisors and you were still debating the full meaning of and the, the nature and the, the extent of the herd immunity debate as late as the 14th of March. It appears to have trundled on as a, as a bone of contention for, for weeks. Can, can I, I, th I think I can understand what's, what, I mean, I have, I, I'm looking at this uh, for, for the first time, but I, let, let, me, let me try to explain what I think this is, a, this is a, a, about. Um, what happened on the 12th of the the 12th of March, was that there was a, a press conference in which uh, we were trying to deal with the, uh, the I, was, I had to level with the public and say, I'm afraid a, 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 a large number of people are going to lose their loved ones before their time. And it was a, a, a pretty grim press conference. And in, in that discussion, we, we were asked about um, how the way through and I think it, it, Patrick s said um, the idea was to, to flatten the curve, suppress the virus, uh, with uh, some measure of herd immunity by September being, I think, a good outcome, was what he said. And um, he, I think he also said something to the, to the effect of, it, you know, it might not be, um, uh, you, you need to suppress, uh, suppress the curve, uh, but not... Uh, it, it might not be necessary to stop everybody or even desirable to stop everybody uh, getting, the, uh, getting the virus because, again, uh, you, you, you might want, some, I think, some measure of herd immunity. Anyway, that was the moment when people all pricked up their ears and say, are, are, are they trying to allow this thing to um, just uh, pass through the population unchecked? <laughs> Uh, uh, with a view to establishing herd immunity, which was not what we wanted, not what Patrick meant. And we had to do quite a lot of, of work to, cl to clear it up. Um, uh, because it, it, our, what we our, our objective was to protect the NHS and save life. And to save life by protecting the NHS. That was our objective. Our strategy was to suppress the curve and to keep the R below one a, as much as we could. At we were going to use everything we could to do that. Herd immunity was going to be, we hoped, a byproduct of that campaign, which might be very long and very difficult. At the same time, in Cobra on the 9th of March, in Sage on the 12th of March, in Cobra on the 12th of March, and in an interview that the chief medical officer gave to the press on the 13th, there were repeated references to the need to delay the peak of the virus as opposed to suppressing it entirely because of the risk of an uncoiled spring, of it bouncing back, yes, the second right. wave. Um, if we could just have that document back, 48399, and 739.42 a.m., please, the 14th of March, probably page three of that document, 48399. It, it appears that this debate about herd immunity and the debate about uncoiled spring had caused you 
considerable concern because at 739.42, you say that's why I was concerned when some on the team were suggesting last week that we actively need a proportion of the population to be infected. And then you say civil service need to grasp. What, what did you mean by that? Uh, so can't say exactly what uh, civil servants I was thinking of in, in, that, in that context. I think probably what I, I, I mean is, look, um, we've set a hair running by mistake. I think Patrick um, you know, really did a, a, a huge job to try to, to clear it up. Um, we, we, all, we all need to, to uh, set the public's mind at rest and explain what we're doing. It's, it's protect the NHS and, and save life. And that's the, that's the priority. Further down the page, 1049.15, in fact, it's the 15th of March, page 6 of this document, you can be seen to be saying, given what's happened in Italy, we simply have no time. Yeah. And um, we can this see is that. The, the 15th. 10.49. 15. There we are. Two thirds of the way down the page, 15th of March, we have no time. We've jumped forward, but that, of course, is the Sunday, the 15th of, of March, in the middle of all the debates that you were having with your advisors. Yes. All right. Uh, just to, to finish off some other points which you've addressed, in relation to behavioural fatigue and, and you being told that the timing of implementations, time of implementation of interventions was vital. The evidence before the inquiry shows that the SAGE meeting on the 13th of March, that's yes. to say on the Friday, you weren't, of course, an attendee at SAGE. No. Was told, and, and the, 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 the minutes of the SAGE meeting make this plain, difficulty maintaining behaviours should not be taken as a reason to delay ah. implementation. Ben Warner, your advisor, was present at that meeting, and he was reporting back to number 10, were you told that, in contrast to what you've been told about the need for timing and behavioural fatigue and so on, SAGE was in fact saying by the 13th, don't take that as a reason to delay implementation? Um, well, in effect, yes, in the sense that that was the... I, and I wasn't told that particular detail about um, uh, behavioural... Uh, fatigue not being a reason to, to delay an implementation. But what I was told uh, was that we had a, uh, a new data. Uh, we were at least, you know, five to seven days uh, further on, possibly more in the curve than we thought we were, and that the margin of manoeuvre that SAGE had seemed to think we had and was offering to us um, on the 12th, if you remember, they, they say then, you know, there are, there, there are four things you can, you can do, uh, self-isolation uh, for seven days if you've got any kind of, uh, of symptoms, um, though even that they say we could postpone till the, till the Monday the, uh, the 16th. Um, then there's household isolation of, uh, for, 14, uh, for 14 days. Then there's a couple more measures. Uh, advice. Advice for, for the um, elderly. For the, uh, for the vulnerable and then for those over 70s. And, and those, those last three, uh, they, they say, can actually be put off for one to three weeks on the, on the 12th. Then on the 13th, that's the, the key moment, really, because that's when I get called back on the Friday evening. Um, I come back on the first thing in the morning, and you know, you know the rest. On the 12th of March, there was a COBRA meeting, um, which you, you chaired, 56209. Um, there is at page six a graph. Yeah. And now I remember looking at this. This page is entitled, What Would the Effect Be on the NHS of Interventions? What date is this again? This, this is, is the 12th of, yeah. of March, so yeah. it's the Thursday. Now, on the right-hand side, you can see graph A, no measures, so that's to say no interventions, and on the bottom right-hand corner, graph B, measures one and two implemented. One and two were seven-day isolation, and um, number two was household isolation. If we could scroll back out again, please. In both graphs... 
the red line friable beds and the black line total NHS beds make plain that whatever you do, unmitigated or mitigated through measures one and two, the NHS will be totally. massively overwhelmed. Yes. Uh, what did you make of that? I was bewildered, to be honest. I remember, I remember looking at that graph and thinking, um, in either case, we are facing a... Um, an absolutely intolerable situation, and um, I, I, I. But the, the, although I clocked it, I, I thought, well, there must be a reason why we're not being told to to go uh, go urgently. Maybe that reason is all the things that we've we've discussed. So I have to admit, and I think I say in my statement, that I think at this point there is a certain amount of, of incoherence in our thinking because that graph makes it clear that things are going wrong. And it, that is cleared up the following day. You didn't yourself ask... Firstly, what can be done to bring the blue no. part of the chart below the black line? Why are we talking in terms of these modest measures, which may or may not even be imposed this week, when we've got to bring the blue part below the lines? I didn't. And, uh, and secondly, why didn't you ask? Why are you presenting me with this and at the same time telling me we mustn't go too early with interventions? Well, you, I, because I was, I'm afraid listening to the um, the advice I was being given about timeliness and I was and, and looking with puzzlement at the at the graphs and what I should have done and I and though thankfully it was only a, a matter of a, 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 a day uh, uh, or two before the, the thing was resolved what I should have done was as soon as I saw that graph said, Hang on, this is not coherent with what you're telling me about about timeliness. Because I because I I do remember looking at it and thinking there was something amiss. Around this time, on the fifth of March, uh, uh, going back to the beginning of the week, the fifth of March, there was a COVID nineteen meeting, at which advice was given to the effect that a prohibition on mass gatherings was not necessary. Did you throughout that week? as you had, in fact, during earlier weeks, receive advice that, um, for epidemiological purposes at any rate, there was no need to shut mass gatherings, sporting events. That was the... the, 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 the but to be fair to the people who were giving the advice, uh, it sounded uh, reasonable at the time, uh, given what we knew, because what they said was, look, if you do this, uh, what you will do is push everybody into the, into the pubs uh, and the, the warm enclosed spaces where transmission will be uh, even faster. So that was the, the, the point that was made. You were, by your own words, of course, only following the science rather than being directed Correct. to the science. It, it must have been apparent to you that this was presentationally disastrous to keep mass gatherings open whilst you were debating the closure of schools as one of the possible interventions. That's true, but I felt that it was certainly the, the public didn't didn't get it, uh, just as, but the, that was true of many of the um, measures that we put in place throughout the pandemic. There was often a more than there, there was often a, a uh, gap between the uh, public conviction about something and the the scientific certainty about the effectiveness of that measure. Borders would be an example. Uh, masks might be another ex example. You've highlighted the importance of communications, Mr Johnson, in terms of leadership and in terms of beginning to direct the country that there were terribly difficult times ahead and impossible choices to be made. The closure of mass gatherings would have sent a vital message, would it not? And I, I had already told people 
on the 9th, uh, so several days before, that they were going to have to restrict social contact. And on the 12th, I had given them a, um, I think, a, a pretty powerful and uh, in many ways frightening message about what was going to happen. But Chelsea, and, please, and the, excuse the, me. the effect, I'm so sorry. Sort of, forgive me, the, the effect of that, I, I, I think, did, did show up in people's behaviour. So that we are clear, the Cheltenham Festival continued the week of the 10th. There was an Atletico Madrid match. Yes. And mass gathering sporting events were not, in fact, shut yes. until the following week. Yes. And as a, a um, with hindsight, uh, as a symbol of the, of the government's earnestness rather than just um, as, a, a, you know, a, being guided by the science, uh, we should perhaps have done that. And um, I agree with you. And no doubt that was in accordance with your own libertarian instincts. Well, at, 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 all, at every stage, um, I was weighing the massive costs of what we were doing to people's psyches, to people's life chances, to, 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 um, to the whole, you know, it, when, when you talk about an economy, uh, you're talking about um, people in all walks of life who suddenly can't get to do the thing that they need to do to, 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 to earn a living. And um, it's a, it's a, what we were obliged to, to do was very, very destructive for, for a, a lot of people who were least able to bear the costs and, and, and least able to, to, uh, to manage it. Over the weekend of the 13th, 14th of March, there was what has been described by a variety of witnesses as that change in strategy. And it matters not for these purposes, Mr Johnson, whether it was an acceleration of the existing plan, a change in strategy or a redirection. There was, on any view, a significant change. Um, it's plain from the evidence, but, but obviously the, the ultimate decision is, is, is for my lady, that there were a number of individuals who were pushing for change. Mr Cummings, with his colleagues, but Ben and Mark Warner, and um, um, also Helen McNamara and Imran Shafi, all met on the Friday night and with Mr Cummings' whiteboard, they worked out that immediate, much more stringent measures were required to prevent the NHS from, from being overwhelmed. During the course of that week, the, the days before that weekend of the 14th, 15th of March, it's obvious from data being provided to number 10, and we've seen part of it in that memo to, to SAGE, showed the likely impact on the NHS. Why wasn't the lead government department, the DHSC, responsible for public health, pushing you harder during that week to <coughs> introduce the more stringent changes? Why do you think that department, it appears from the evidence, was still trying to go for the squash the sombrero part mitigation, herd immunity route, as opposed to recognising we must have suppression. We've got to stop this now before it's too late. I, I think probably, so I, I, my interpret my memory of it is, is, slightly, is slightly different from, from, from that account, or maybe it might be the same. But, it, but what I felt happened was that um, we were... We were in a state now when we knew we had a massive problem. We knew we were probably going to have to act uh, in, in ways that we didn't really, hadn't bargained for and didn't, uh, and, and were still being developed. Um, we still thought we had a bit of time, but not very much, probably. And that was what the scientific guidance seemed to say. If, and if you look at the, those, those, that long paper by Sage on the on the 12th, you can, you can see that, and I quoted a, a bit of it. My impression, and I may be wrong about this, but my impression was that on the 13th, 
the, the radical change that you, you refer to is really one about the timeliness thing. And what I think Sage saw, and this is what was conveyed to me by CMO and CSA, was that the virus was now spreading much more rapidly in the UK than they had bargained for. And therefore, we had to accelerate. And so I think that it was uh, a confluence of um, opinion. But the people I talked to on the, on the Saturday morning were the people you'd expect. It was Chris, Patrick, Imran, Stu, uh, my other advisors. Um, so I, I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to um, s allow the inquiry to just to, to run away with the idea that it all would have uh, sailed on had it not been for the intervention of uh, of number ten. I think that Sage um, themselves on the thirteenth had had seen very seriously and very clearly that something needed to be done. That was, that was, that was, at any rate, was my impression. Until Saturday, the 14th of March, when Mr Cummings presented his whiteboard in the middle of numerous other meetings and talked about Plan B. Until that point, no one in the DHSC has said, we're off the mark, we've gone wrong, we've got to accelerate and impose more stringent measures, did they? My impression is that the, the critical moment was indeed, as you say, that, that SAGE meeting when I think that uh, a number of scientists, uh, epidemiologists, look at the, looked at the, the data and, and said, we are, we are, I'm afraid we're off the pace here. And that, I think that was what happened. In his evidence to this inquiry, Mr Hancock said that on that Friday the 13th of March, he called you to tell you that there needed to be an immediate lockdown. Do you recall that call or not? I, I'm afraid I don't, uh, uh, but it's, it's been a long time. In his witness statement, Mr Cummings says at page 49, during the course of the Saturday, quote, the Prime Minister asked reasonable questions, including why aren't Hancock, Witty, Valance telling me this? Do you recall that discussion? I, I, I remember them being there. Uh, but I might be. There was a meeting, well, there were, there were four meetings. There was a meeting with Sedwell, Valence, Witty, then a meeting with Cummings, Reynolds, Shaffey, Lister, Witty, and a host of others, then a follow up meeting yourself with Mr. Cummings and the Warners, then a second follow up meeting, and then another meeting. You had a lot of meetings that day. Yeah. At one of them, Mr. Cummings says you turned to him and said, Why aren't Hancock, Witty, Valence telling me this? Do you recall that debate? I think I, I don't re recall it, um, but what's certainly possible is that I was alluding to. I was I was looking with, you know, um, dismay at uh, what was happening, dis dismay about what we were going to to have to do, and reflecting that, you know, this was not the message. I, I mean, I'm, I'm conjecturing. That, but this is not the message that I've been having from them in the past few days. You but, don't recall. I don't, I, don't, I don't recall saying that. All right. Let's, let's have a quick look at um, the, one of the papers, the briefing on the COVID response that was put before you on the Saturday, 183889. This is the document which sets out the, the current plan and the proposed alternative plan. Briefing on COVID-19 yes. response. There's a, a variant on the graph that you saw before, but you can yes, see I at the bottom this. of the page, current plan. If you could scroll back out again, we can see current plan and alternative plan at the bottom of the page. And in summary, is this correct, Mr Johnson? Throughout yes. that weekend of the 14th and 15th of March, there were um, multiple meetings. V a variety of different people pushed for different speeds of intervention. We can see from the WhatsApps that some people said, go now. Other people said, we've got to move fast. But there was, a, in, in any event, a very real understanding that more had to be done, more stringent measures had to be imposed, 
and Cobra would have to consider all that on the Monday when it next convened. Yes. Um, so uh, my, my impression was that uh, what Ben Warner and others were, were, were doing, and I don't know about the differences in, in, in views, but what, I, what they were doing was trying to take the, the, the SAGE meeting of the previous day and, 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 and really give to me the, the, lo the logical consequences of that. But only you could decide the strategies, and you decided, did you not, by the Sunday night when you called Sir Patrick Valance and Sir Chris Whitty to, to another meeting, um, you decided that the alternative plan would have to be um, followed and, and you gave, as we'll see in a moment, an, a number of directions as to what needed to be done. Uh, yes, I mean, it became, it was, it was absolutely clear by the Saturday that we, we had to act and we were out of time. The inquiry needs to, to ask you this. To what extent did you appreciate by the Sunday night that a lockdown decision, a stay-at-home mandatory order, was inevitable? It obviously wasn't imposed until Monday the 23rd of March, and during the course of the week there were a great deal many complex, extremely complex operational issues to circumnavigate. A shielding system having to be built effectively from scratch getting hold of data from the NHS, we can see there were real issues about the preparedness of the Cabinet Office around that time from Mr Cummings' WhatsApps that refer to cab off being terrifyingly shit, no plans, totally behind the pace. Was it a question, A, of you deciding that there had to be a lockdown, but that time would be needed to put it into place, or B, you would start the arrangements which could accommodate a lockdown, but that that decision wouldn't then be taken for another week? Uh, I think that looking at the, the graphs, I was reconciled or getting increasingly reconciled to the fact that we were going to uh, have to do a, a huge amount more to suppress the, the virus. And I... Um, you know, just to get back to an early point, this was not something we'd done for a country that had been through. Um, it was it was hard to get one's one's head round. The the legal uh, complications were enormous. Um, how to do it? As you rightly say, Mr. Keith, you know, that all, all that needed to be to be worked through. We had started the bill uh, a long a, a long time ago. I mean, fifth, fifth of February, we start the the coronavirus bill. But I think my state of mind then is is. I'm now, I'm now more or less in virus fighting mode. I'm thinking, I'm, I'm thinking we, 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 you know, this is, you know, there's, no, there's absolutely nothing. Yet. We've got to throw that. We've got to, we've got to sort this out. And so the, there's then a series of things that we do leading up to the, to the 23rd. But you weren't entirely in virus fighting mood. If we look at 273, 872, page 55, we can see part of the seemingly perennial debate in your own mind as to what should be done. In, Mr Cummings asks Lee Kane if you could just scroll into that screenshot. Get in here, he's melting down. Yeah. Rich is saying bond markets may not fund our debt. He's back to Jaws mode. I've literally said the same thing ten times and he still won't absorb it. I'm exhausted talking to him. I've had to sit here for two hours just to stop him saying stupid things. Mr Johnson, y y you would be inhuman, perhaps, if you hadn't, uh, in that terrible week, oscillated and backed and veered in your own mind about what had to be done. But is it fair to say that you made your doubts and your oscillation clear to those around you? I, I think it was my job to uh, address all the consequences of what we were doing and to test the policy, uh, which I was, as you can see, uh, determined that we deliver and get on and 
do, and it was, even though it was a completely novel policy, absolutely a dramatic thing to do. Uh, I, I, what, he, what he's referring to here uh, is a conversation with the Chancellor where I'm, I'm talking about the, the downsides, I'm talking about the costs, and how negligent, it would have been totally negligent uh, not to have had such a conversation, not to have gone through uh, with the, uh, with the, the, uh, the UK, HM Treasury the economic ramifications of what I was proposing to do. And, and for, I, 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 need to, I need to do that. It didn't, it didn't in any way, just I think the key thing is, it didn't in any way stop us, uh, de or divert us from the crescendo of actions that we took. Forgive me, the suggestion is not being made here that you, having reached a view on public health grounds, took yourself off to speak to the Treasury and, and see what arguments needed to be made properly on behalf of the economic consequences that would uh, ensue from a lockdown. It is that your own decision-making, your own judgment, backed and veered, and that, by implication, th this is a, a poor example of leadership function. You couldn't make up your own mind no, I, as I, to what should be done. On the contrary, I've made up my mind. Uh, we are getting on and doing it. Uh, we are not being diverted. I'm, I'm, I've got the Chancellor of the Exchequer with me saying that there's a risk to the UK bond markets and our ability to raise sovereign debt. This matters massively to people in this country. It matters to the livelihoods of people up and down the land. I have to go through the arguments. And, and that is what I was doing. At 146636, page 92, your own private secretary, Imran Shafi, recorded in his notebook that on Thursday, the 19th of March, the same day, in fact, as these, those communications, you said, we're killing the patient to tackle the tumour, large people who will die. Why are we destroying everything for people who will die anyway soon? Bed blockers. Is that not indicative of an absence of consistent position by you and a clear decision that on the basis of the scientific no. advice that you had received, these stringent interventions were necessary. No, it's, a, uh, no, it's, a, it's an indication of the cruelty of the choice that we faced and the appalling uh, balancing act that I had to do throughout the pandemic. And it, it, in, in order to, to what, if I indeed I said something like that, what I was uh, saying, w w which is the, the truth, which is that in order to, uh, to drive down the virus, to stamp out the virus, you, you have to do things that are going to be very damaging in all sorts of other ways. It's, uh, uh, perhaps it's not, um, it wasn't designed to be um, a, a, a publicly uh, broadcast, but I was trying to, I was trying to, to find a way it, crisply to summarize uh, what I saw as part of the, part of the problem. Um, and I, I needed people to, and I think, by the way, that what I hope the inquiry will be able to, to, to do, I needed people to be able to do a faster uh, reckoning of the uh, benefits, the impacts of, uh, of, the, M of the MPIs uh, and the costs uh, at the same time. As for the reference to so-called um, uh, bed blockers, that that is, I, I, I assume this is the, this is the the nineteenth of of March, is it? Yes. And well, we've we've only a couple of days previously decided to um, do the the March discharge strategy. And the issue there is that we're facing a crisis in we only have about 100,000 beds in the NHS and uh, in the acute sector. And plainly, sadly, many of those 
uh, were, were delayed discharge patients, and we, ne we needed to sort that out. Two other issues in relation to the Thursday and the Friday. On the 19th of March, that Thursday, you had a meeting with a newspaper proprietor. Mr. Cummings has suggested that that meeting, which appeared in your diary as a personal social matter, was not perhaps the best use of your time in the middle of this crisis. Well, it, it, well I, I can't remember exactly what happened at that meeting. It was a very brief meeting. Um, uh, Mr. The uh, newspaper proprietor in question uh, doubtless uh, wanted to know about what was happening to uh, to London and why and, and the where he owns and, and indeed the whole country and, and wanted to be informed and I wanted him to be supported. So was the meeting to do with COVID? Was it COVID related, Mr. Johnson? Uh, I, I I can't remember, but I'm absolutely certain it must have been. On that Thursday and Friday, there was then debate also, wasn't there, about whether or not, in light of the figures showing that the NHS in London would be overwhelmed sooner there might have to be a lockdown for London yeah. first before the rest of the country. But that debate resolved itself, didn't it, when it became apparent that there was little point in locking London down if the rest of the country was going to be locked down just a matter of days <coughs> thereafter. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. All right. The final weekend of the 21st, 22nd of March, Sir Chris Whitty produced a paper dated the, the 22nd of March, in fact, called coronavirus summary of strategic and tactical approach to the epidemic and that was presented to you uh, at the second of a COVID-19 strategy meeting on the, the 22nd. The lockdown <coughs> was of course ordered on the, the 23rd following um, a meeting of COBRA and a, a strategy ministerial group meeting. The material put before you, Mr. Johnson, over that weekend shows that whilst there were positive, some positive trends, the level of compliance by the population in relation to the measures which had Sorry. previously been imposed on the 16th and 20th of March failed to reach the necessary 75% required to have some degree of certainty that the R number could be brought below one. Is, is that a fair summary? Yeah, that's that, that's completely right. And I remember, I think Patrick making some point, uh, making points about there being too much social mixing in uh, in parks and so on. Now, obviously, the schools had been shut from the twentieth. You had directed the closure of non-essential retail and leisure outlets and, and everything else on Friday the twentieth. Yes. A few days before, on the sixteenth you'd had the first set of interventions. Why, on that Monday, did you not wait to see whether or not the measures from the previous week, which had, of course, been imposed in good faith and specifically designed to bring the R below one, right. which was your overriding strategy, might work? Why didn't you wait to see whether or not those measures would, over the course of that week, start to bring R down below one, as you had fervently hoped and properly believed they would when you'd imposed them the week before? I think that, by this stage, the, the, for the simple reason, the scientific uh, advice was, was starting to become much more precautionary. And I think that the... Um, I, I, I sensed from what I was being told about the effectiveness of the previous messages that we, we had to do more. And looking at the shape of the curves that I had seen, I thought that we, you know, we'd, run out of, we'd run out of wiggle room. And I, I thought we had to... do what we could. There was no hard data, of course, as to when the NHS would be overwhelmed. You are not in the position of being able to ever to be given hard data as to when that right. would be, because you were in the context of a epidemiological a, a, exponential curve. And nor was it. You could not know exactly how many additional deaths would be spared 
if you took the measures on the 23rd of March, as opposed to waiting to see whether the measures from the 20th would work. You just weren't in that territory. And that being so, why didn't you wait to see whether or not the previous measures should be allowed to work? You say, looking at the shape of the curves, I thought we'd run out of wriggle room. I sensed more needed to be done. That was a very, and this is the suggestion to you, a, a very uncertain foundation upon which to order the ultimate sanction, the mandatory stay-at-home order. I accept that. Um, I think that, um, and it, it, I'm, I'm troubled by the decisions that I took for all sorts of reasons, and none of them, as we said at the beginning, were were easy. Um, I've been, you know, the, the government clearly, from some quarters, gets criticised for for going ahead with um, a lockdown, and you know, as, as, as we were discussing earlier, the the very f word lockdown doesn't really appear in government vocabulary until until the fourteenth. Mm. Um, but we did it uh, completely on the on the twenty third. I think it was really a, a a measure of my anxiety about the about the curve. The, it just it, it seemed to me that the I, I, I no longer had the uh, the the luxury of waiting. I, I just it, it was over. We had to the the the, the what I was hearing from the from the scientists, the um, my sense that probably they were right to be doubtful about the efficacy of the uh, of, of the measures. I I had a hunch that that might be that might be correct. I couldn't know. Um, I thought we could know. Not, I thought we, could, we 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 were out of time, and we had to do everything that we could. And so that's why we 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 went to. You know, we we close schools on the on the Friday. We we, we close non-essential retail, and and then we do the, the the stay at home on on the Monday. But on the Friday, when you close the schools and you shut the retail, you weren't at that stage. You hadn't at that stage already determined that there would be a lockdown on the Monday. That decision was only made in light of the information over the weekend about levels of compliance. I, I think that that's correct, isn't that, it? I think that's that's. That's probably true, but I think that my general sense of where we were likely to be going had had, had changed, and I and I I I thought that we were going to have to do whatever it took. Five six two one three page four is the relevant part of a of a meeting of Cobra. The Cobra decision, the Cobra meeting that took place on the Monday after you had given the directions on the Sunday yeah. night, COBRA considered whether or not that additional social distancing measure, that is to say, a mandatory stay-at-home order, should be imposed. This meeting took place at 5 o'clock on that Monday. If you look at the current situation update in the first three paragraphs, you will see a reference to the figures for compliance being positive in part, for social distancing measures, the figures were positive and showed there'd been an encouraging drop in footfall, but in some areas these were not these were not where yet at a level, yet at a level that was acceptable. But park attendance, paragraph three, had gone up by two hundred percent. And you'll recall in the press pictures of yeah. thousands of people attending parks across the land, and queues in shops had increased. There were regional differences and there were lower compliance rates in some areas outside London. If we just scroll, and we needn't pause for long, but if you just scroll over the document, we can see there is much more detail provided about levels of compliance, the tube, and then on page six at the top, the chair said the measures were not to stop all work. There was work in government yep. and other offices that must be maintained. There was a balance. The attorney general gave advice on legal matters. Some points were made about enforcement and deterrence. 
and at 12, the measures needed to be taken as social distancing was not being adhered to at present. <laughs> it appears, Mr Johnson, from that paragraph, that you understood there to be a binary issue. Either the 20th of March measures were being adhered to, or they were not. And if they were not, there was no option but to go the ultimate step and impose the, the lockdown. There was no debate in that meeting, was there, as to whether or not, to use the words of the Chief Medical Officer, the measures from Friday might yet do the job. I think that's, that's fair, but I want to try to explain to you why I still thought it was right to throw everything at it. And the, the basic reason is that I had seen from the events of the last, which we've discussed extensively, of the last um, two, three weeks, that we'd systematically underestimated speed, underestimated prevalence, uh, and uh, we didn't have any other shot. We, 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 we didn't have the uh, systems to uh, control the virus that you know, perhaps I believed earlier in the month that we, that we did. I didn't know what other tools I had as Prime Minister to protect large numbers of people uh, from this virus. And I felt fundamentally that I was out of time. And what I believed in the, in the previous week was that we, did, we, we, stood, we still had some wiggle room, because that seemed to be what I was, I was hearing. I might have been wrong, but I took the view on the Sunday uh, and Monday that we, we, were, we, were, we were just out of time, and the, the thing was, was too big, and the curve was too aggressive. The inquiry has put this proposition to Sir Chris Whitty, um, and also to Mr Hancock. <coughs> Did you act because, in effect, you were told by the chief medical officer and the government's scientific, uh, chief scientific advisor that the nature of the exponential growth was such that, regardless of the actual number of NHS places, regardless of any data that might indicate that the NHS would be overwhelmed or when it would occur, and regardless of the number of additional deaths that would be caused if you didn't act, the nature of the exponential growth was such that huge numbers of additional deaths and collapse were inevitable at some point, and you simply couldn't gamble that they would not eventually occur. Is that the nub of it? I, I, I took very seriously, and I listened very hard, to, uh, to Chris and, uh, and Patrick. And it felt to me as though they were basically saying that the UK was now in a position where we had to do everything we could to restrain contact and that that was our best shot at, at, at protecting the NHS and, and saving life. And, and so that was what I did. Can you I up for a second? Forgive me. I'm so sorry, Mindy. No, it's just, um, you mentioned earlier, Mr Johnson, about um, how some would say you shouldn't lock down at all. When you did decide that we had to lock down, um, did you consider the arguments to say you should never go that far and impose that kind of level of draconian restriction on uh, the liberty of the population? Did you consider the argument against lockdown, or did you...? I, 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 I did, and, um, I mean, I didn't... I gave, I'm, I'm afraid to say at that stage I gave it pretty short shrift because I thought that my job was to protect uh, human life and, and that is the number one duty of, of, of government. And I, I, I thought that if the NHS was overwhelmed, then the risk of truly tragic scenes in the UK of the kind we'd seen in, in, in Lombardy uh, was very real. And, and, and thank heavens that did not happen, thanks to the amazing work of the, uh, of the NHS and, you know, as I said at the, right at the beginning, hundreds of thousands of, of people. But I felt I had to, to do what I could to give them the best possible chance. And I had no other, I had no other tool, literally nothing else. 
Thank you. And is that why, Mr Johnson, examination of the COVID-19 strategy ministerial group meeting on the Saturday, the COVID-19 strategy ministerial group meeting on the Monday morning at 9.15, and of the COBRA meeting that we've looked at at 5 p.m. on the Monday, shows very little, if any, debate about the countervailing non-public health argument. It's just not there. Uh, that doesn't mean that it wasn't happening. And as you've, you've seen uh, a, a reference to it in my, in my conversation with the, the Chancellor. There was a huge amount of, of thought going into it. Um, but the higher objective had to be saving human life. And it, it is perhaps not surprising, but within three days of that momentous decision, 48399, page 17, having seen a, an article in the press, and it, it's a matter entirely, of course, for, for my lady, you, you ask the extremely salient questions, although I now can't see them. If we could scroll back out. Yes, please, if we could scroll back out, please. I must say I agree with every word of this week's spec, spectator, perhaps. Cover story by Professor John Lee. We have no idea how many COVID deaths are truly additional. Mm. When COVID fatalities are recorded, we have no idea whether it's merely present or actually the cause of death. We have no idea what proportion yeah. may have had the disease asymptomatically already. So we've taken these extraordinary steps without being truly sure how deadly it is. And is those expressions of doubt, Mr Johnson, why you said earlier that the basis upon which you proceeded was one of precautionary approach yeah. in public health terms, yeah. because in the absence of any hard data, we, you believed you had no option. I, I, I couldn't take the, the gamble with, uh, with, with public health. But I was conscious that, you know, we've had the argument about, the discussion about behavioural fatigue, that takes many forms. Uh, one is that the, me the media, understandably, uh, so, you know, a lot, a lot of, them, of, of the media, uh, need, they, they need a proper explanation of, of, of why this is necessary and, and how it's working. And they need, and, uh, and I really think that um, we need to, you know, we, there is still work to be done in this area. And so here I'm, I'm saying, um, you know, we need to, if we're being attacked for, um, you know, not standing up our actions, then we need to substantiate it. We need to say, no, 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 this is, this is what public health requires. And so on this essential issue, the inquiry wants to ask three direct questions. Firstly, from what you've said, Mr Johnson, and this may be entirely obvious, was it your position that the lockdown measures, the stay-at-home mandatory order of the 23rd of March, was absolutely necessary? I believe that it was. And I believe that it helped to suppress the R. Um, I think that it was cumulative. I think that it, 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 the R started to go down as a result of a series of things that we did, uh, and also, frankly, as a result of popular anxiety about COVID anyway. Um, but I've got to tell you, in all honesty, I, 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 can't, I find it difficult to quantify the impact that those measures had. And the, the more we can do to um, explain why NPI, is, M, uh, for, why NPI measures of any kind work, uh, why they're necessary to the satisfaction of, uh, of everybody, 
the easier it will be for government next time and the, the more public buy-in there will be. Is that public, buy-in, public buy-in was, I think, already very high, but I think it would be a, a great thing. Is that a reference to, to objective analysis of, of life quality and, and the, the outcomes the, in terms of life and death and quality of life of particular measures? I, th- I think that what we, we, we all need... So I think that the... You, you asked, did the lockdown work? Do I believe that it worked? I, I do. But um, as a, as a layperson, I would like that... And I saw the Royal Society study on this that I think Chris had a hand in, in, in generating. Um, it was very interesting, but I think we need to understand with a lot more granular clarity, exactly what these NPIs deliver. I think that and was Sir Patrick Valence's predecessor, but, but it matters not. Oh, forgive me. Is that the report into what the nature of no, interventions it was, it, it are? Came in out, no, no, sorry, it came out after the pandemic. It was, uh, yeah, it in, in, indeed. It came out just before this inquiry. That's right. All right. Um, and on that first proposition, you accept, of course, that because the government did not wait further to see whether the measures of the 16th and 20th of March would work, we will never know. Um, yes, but I, w- but I had got to... And, 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 and I suppose that's um, scientifically you know, regrettable, but I, but I, I thought we, we had no time to fight. We, ha- we couldn't wait. The second question... Do you assess that if the government had acted sooner, had awoken to the true nature of the crisis and the seriousness of our position, and had imposed the measures of the 12th, 16th and 20th of March earlier, when the degree of viral transmission in the country was lower, that is to say there was a lower prevalence, then the need for a mandatory stay-at order, which stay-at-home order, which, of course, was on the cusp of the decision-making on the Monday, the 23rd of March, might have been avoided? Um, well, that, uh, I, I have to say that I, I, I doubt, but I don't, I don't know. Um, I think that um, the, the virus was, is extremely contagious, um, I think that it was going to describe a, a pretty nasty curve, uh, almost whatever we uh, we did. Um, I, I'm not certain that we would have been able to avoid the extreme action that we eventually took by acting a, 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 a few days earlier. Um, but you know, I, I would defer on that to, to to scientists. And the third proposition based upon, in part, the evidence from some of the scientific witnesses who have given evidence in this inquiry, on the premise that the lockdown was necessary on the 23rd of March, was it nevertheless imposed too late? Could it not have been imposed earlier had the government been rather more alert in middle to late February and in early March, had it not been blindsided to some extent by the debates about herd immunity and not going too early and behavioural fatigue and so on, and understood properly the data in its possession, thereby allowing it to impose the lockdown in the weeks of the 9th or 16th of March? I think that the um, all your... uh, Conditionals, I would, I would delete except the uh, the one about the data. Um, I think that that was the the key thing that the um, that Sage lacked, and it was it was the sudden appreciation that we were much further along the uh, the curve than, than they'd thought. We weren't four weeks behind France or Italy. We, we were a, a couple of weeks. Uh, maybe less, um, and they were clearly wrong. 
uh, in their initial estimation. Uh, we were clearly wrong in our, uh, our estimation of, of, of where the peak was going to be. And so the, uh, that penny dropped, that we, we realized that on the, uh, on the evening of the 13th into the 14th. And, and then we acted. But I think once we, once we decided to act, I, I think it was um, pretty fast from, from flash to bang. Perfect timing, Mr. Keith. Uh, we'll take a 15 minute break. Thank you. Back at 10 past.
Please. Mr. Johnson, as is well known, after the first lockdown, your government published a roadmap out of lockdown uh, in May. Yes. On the 10th of May, I think it was presented to Parliament, our plan to rebuild. Um, you make plain in your statement that you were extremely keen to reopen schools. Uh, was that because you you felt that keeping children out of school was, was arguably one of the greatest harms of the lockdown? Absolutely. You addressed the nation on the 10th of May and you included an instruction that those who could not work from home should be actively encouraged to go to work. So, to use your words, work from home if you can, but you should go to work if you can't work from home. Um, th the witness statement from Mr Sunak <coughs> expresses um, how he was frustrated that there was, as he sees it, over-compliance with the stay-at-home messaging. Um, and he, he believes that the, uh, the possibility, or, or rather the, the likelihood that many people would ignore the active encouragement to go to work and not go to work had uh, an exacerbation of the, uh, exacerbated the economic impact of the lockdown. In your uh, in your communications with your colleagues on this subject, did, did you in July um, say this, uh, in July 2021, looking back to 2020, yes. I arguably cocked it up last time with finger wagging to everyone to get on and do some work. Do you recall saying that, expressing regret a year later that you had got the work from home if you can, but go to work if you can't work from home, message wrong. I, I think that it was a very difficult time as we came out of, I mean, the whole thing was unbelievably difficult, but the, as we came out of lockdown in, uh, in the summer of, uh, early summer of um, 2020 for, for the first time, that you know, some areas remain under a, a lot of restrictive measures, um, I felt strongly that the, people have made such a sacrifice to get the R do down that we, we must try to um, allow people some, some freedom. And I wanted, I wanted the, um, you know, the benefits of the exertion, as it were, the effort to get the R down to, uh, to be felt throughout the country for people to, to be able to do things again. Um, and it, I think it's, it's probably true that I wanted to, to see people back in the, uh, uh, back at work, and um, I think that psychologically, emotionally, people, uh, a lot of people, were in a very different place, and they felt that they'd uh, seen a terrifying pandemic. Uh, they were still very apprehensive, and they didn't want government lecturing them about about what to do. And, and so that's probably what I'm getting at. Was the speed of the release very hard to gauge? Very. In Sir Patrick Valence's diaries, 273901, at page 66, he describes you as being very bullish and wanting everything to be released sooner and more extremely than we would. By we, he means the scientists. And then, page 92, in the context of a meeting with the Prime Minister, actually having a discussion about letting it rip, 624 on the 12th of July, Prime Minister still wants to push opening too fast. And if you just pause there, then on 94215, which is a WhatsApp group um, extract between yourself and Mr Hancock in the top team group in, on the 15th of July, you say, I was calling because I'm very worried about winter. Yeah. We've gone fast on releasing lockdown. I'm getting no traction on doing what's needed to protect the NHS. Cases in track and trace are starting to rise. Of course, that's dated the, the 15th of July, by which time the NHS track and trace system was up and running. So it, it, may we presume from, from these messages that it, it was very difficult to decide whether 
you were going too fast, whether you were wanting to reopen, let it rip, to use your words, or, or whether or not, in fact, you were going too fast and then becoming overly concerned or concerned about the winter and the rise in cases. Yes. Well, so, uh, first of all, on this, the, the, the WhatsApps with, with Matt here, I think you've got to, to, to remember that this is a, a, a Cabinet minister also uh, thinking about his budget, uh, if you read that carefully, you can see that what he's really saying is he needs more money, which is what all, all secretaries of state rightly do uh, in, their, in their messages. So that, that's part of the conversation. Uh, but clearly, the, the issue was that I think I always realised, and certainly nobody um, disagreed with me, that when we came out of, of lockdown, when we, when, when we went into lockdown as as Patrick said in, the, in that first important press conference on, the, on, on March the 12th, uh, you can push it down, but, it, but in, with an unimmunised population, it will bounce back. And so I always knew that throughout the summer, we were basically in remission, as it were, and that the, the, the thing would come back. And... Um, it was a it was a very it was a very very diff difficult judgment to make. You said that the the last WhatsApp in the top team group there on the page on the screen it may, may be reflective of a secretary of state being concerned with money. Oh, isn't that your wording, or have we misread this? This is you saying I'm very worried about winter, and him saying what's the evidence on rising new cases, or is it the other way around? Um, you, we we, you, we you, can't you, tell from the. You, 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 I, 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 I may be totally wrong about this, but I read that as being Matt, Matt in the green to me. All right. Saying um, we can take a risk on reducing lockdown, or we can take a risk on not building up the NHS this winter. And what he's really saying, like all good secretaries of state for health, is give us the money, um, and and. And I, 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 that's what I understood partly. But also what he's saying is the cases are rising. Hmm. And that's, you know, and that was no particular surprise to me. The question in, 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 the, in, the, in the summer autumn is what's the, what's the tactics? The objective is still protect the NHS, save lives. What's, uh, what's, uh, do, we have a new, do we have any new tactics now? And it was apparent to the government and to you personally, of course, that cases started going up. At a relatively early stage, they plateaued, of course, well, they came right down after the lockdown, then they plateaued for a while, but they started to go up in, in July. So well in advance, in fact, of the Eat Out to Help Out, Eat Out to Help Out scheme, well in advance of September, October. That's exactly right. And contrary to, um, you know, the, our... Uh, our hopes in the early phases, certainly by the end of May, beginning of June, there is the, a very small percentage of the population has antibodies. So you're looking at a huge number of people uh, who, who are still potential COVID victims. And that's very, very difficult. And in fact, the, the percentage of the population that had, that had been immunised by virtue of infection was very, very low. It was around about 6 or 7%. That's exactly right. All right. And, and that, of course, was therefore dispositive of the arguments about herd immunity. Correct. Because, in it. fact, very few people were immunised by virtue of infection. You've got it. As it happened. All right. Now, to divert to a completely different subject, the, the devolved administrations, please. Um, in your statement, you say that the interests of the devolved administrations did not always align with England's or the United Kingdom's interests. That's an inevitable part of a devolved system. Yes. Was that a, a nod to the fact that the United Kingdom powers were constrained by public health legislation, the Coronavirus Act, Public Health Act, Control of Diseases Act, but on the ground this public health crisis was a devolved issue because it was for each devolved nation to determine its own course in terms of the public health measures it took. Did it matter ultimately? There has been a great deal of evidence given about differences of approach in terms of presentation, debates about whether or not politically one or more devolved administrations took a different route 
for, or took a different route for political reasons. Also, whether or not, when they attended meetings, they were simply informed of what the position would be, rather than being encouraged to generally debate the decision. Overall, did the constituent parts of the United Kingdom generally work well in the face of this crisis? Yes, I hope what m many of your respondents will also have said is that uh, overwhelmingly the collaboration was excellent and the, uh, the, the governments of the, of the DAs, uh, uh, you know, it, there, was, there was far, far more that, that united us and divided us. I know that sounds trite, uh, but it's got to be said, and it was really a, a, a big UK effort and the, the country really pulled together. I was making a, a, a much more limited point, and um, you know, it is no disrespect to the uh, First Minister of Scotland or anybody else, the um, uh, uh, Chief Minister of Northern Ireland, Wales. They, they understandably were, were looking to uh, talk directly to their own um, electorates. There were going to be times when they they differed from. The, the, the main UK government message. And I thought that was sometimes at risk of being confusing at a time when we really needed to land messages simply. And I, and I could see, and people were endlessly playing back, oh, but you know, Scotland says this, uh, England, says, England says this, you know, um, Wales is doing a fire breaker, uh, uh, circuit breaker, um, and so on. You didn't, I think, perhaps help yourself though, Mr Johnson, in, in this debate, because Emails between Mr. Cummings and Helen McNamara uh, show that Mr. Cummings said the PM's view and mine on COBRAs, this was in the context of debate about who should attend COBRA, is they're hopeless as decision making entities and actively cause trouble for communications because some attendees at COBRA and Mr. Cummings had in mind the default administration's leak immediately afterwards. Well, was that your view? I think that it, sometimes that that was the case, and that was a that was, in my view, a, a problem. Um, perhaps we could have found a better way to to manage it, um, but it that was that was certainly one of the problems. Mm. The the system was uh, understood not to be working particularly well in terms of the government structures the systemic structures um, at the top and in relation to the relationship of the DAs because there was uh, the series of the four ministerial implementation groups um, between March and May and they were then done away with and replaced by COVID-S and, and COVID-O. You, you directed, um, following advice from your cabinet secretary, that there should be a new rhythm of meetings uh, the 9 a.m. meetings to which the DAs were not um, uh, invited. Uh, and you, you directed that consideration should be given to using something called the Joint Ministerial Committee. But the Joint Ministerial Committee was never used, was it, for the purposes of meeting with the DAs? I, I think that the... So, f first of all, I think the, the COBRA's had the problems that we've... we've We've identified uh, there was a, there was a problem with with messaging, and I think that was a serious problem. Um, I, I I think that in in future there has to be some way of having a a joined up a UK um, pandemic uh, response, and how you how you get to that, I've got an open mind. Uh, I, I see a lot of my colleagues are against the. The Civil Contingencies Act. Um, uh, I'm happy to, to defer to, to them on that point. Uh, I wonder whether you could amend the 1984 Public Health Act so as to have an exemption for pandemics. Um, uh, it, it just seems to me that something needs to be done to fix this whilst taking account of the legitimate concerns of the DAs, their legitimate desire to be uh, involved and to, and, to, and to contribute. But that we need to find a better way to get a single message. Um, there was a body called the Review of Intergovernmental Relations. I think it reported in yes. January 22 
So just at the end of the, the pandemic, yes, just the end of the, the crisis, which recommended that the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom should meet with the heads of the devolved governments on a regular basis. But that came later. Yeah. During the crisis, you, you um, ordered that um, Michael Gove, the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, should chair regular meetings with the devolved administrations. Um, but, but there were difficulties, whether or not, in setting up that structure. It took time for those meetings to be arranged. Do you recall that? I don't recall the, the delay, but I, I do re remember asking Michael to do it. I think he was ideally uh, placed to do it. I think he did a very, very good job of, um, of, of working with the, with the DAs. Um, that didn't stop some of the raggedness that, I, that, that mm. I've, I've talked about. Um, if I had my time again, if, in, if, with hindsight, I think it's an area where I would have tried, even though it was, I was very pushed for time, I would have tried to spend more time uh, with, the, with the DAs and really try to bring them with me. But I, you know, I, I, I'm afraid I, I'm, it may just be that I'm overestimating my, um, a, 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 my ability to, to get a consensus. I think there was always the risk of, of divergence. Well, you may, with respect, be misrepresenting your true views, because in your statement you said it is optically wrong in the first place for the United Kingdom Prime Minister to hold regular meetings with the other DA First Ministers. I, and I, well, I think that's... I, I, I happen to think that's also true. Um, I well, think, they, can't, I think, they can't both be right. Well, I, 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 I think that... Um, well, sometimes you can do things that um, you, you think are... Um, you know, constitutionally um, uh, a bit weird uh, if, if it will help the general cause of fighting the pandemic. Um, I, you know, I th I, 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 but let me, let me su summarise. I, I, I think that there's an issue. It's, it's not a huge, huge issue, nothing like as big as many of the other issues that the... Um, the inquiry needs to, to look at, but we, we do need to sort it out. We need a, we need a, a better way to get a, a, a unified uh, message for the UK. Mr Johnson, you didn't try very hard, to use your words, to bring the DAs with you because you took the view that optically it was wrong to be seen to be meeting with their first ministers because it might look like a kind of, to use your words, mini-EU. You asked the chance of the Duchy of Lancaster, I Michael did. Gove, to chair the meetings instead. And you made it quite plain to the First Ministers of the devolved administrations that you had, you had taken the view that they were prone to leaking from the COBRA meetings and also prone to taking decisions in this public health crisis for nakedly political reasons. Well, I, I, I'm not certain that I, I said that to them in... The, in so many words, but maybe, 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 I, maybe, I, maybe, I, maybe you've got some uh, evidence that I, I did. I certainly thought that that was a risk, and, I, and from time to time, I, um, I felt that the coherence of the UK message was being undermined, mm. and there's got to be a way to, to fix it. I thought Michael did an excellent job. Um, I sometimes wonder whether I could have done more in that respect myself, but I, I, frankly, I doubt it. There were obviously divergences of approach, both in relation to the, the substantive responses to the crisis, tears, fire breakers, circuit breakers, and what was done in relation to schools and so on. And there were also differences, were there not, in relation to public communications. So the messages, messaging across the United Kingdom wasn't always um, pointing in the same direction. Ultimately, did it matter that there were those differences of approach epidemiologically or that in terms of communication, you were not all singing from the same hymn sheet? I think it did matter. I think that clarity and, some, uh, and, and unity of message was, was very important. Um, data. Plainly, the United Kingdom government was where it could, taking decisions in relation to what should be happening in each of the four nations of the United Kingdom. 
as I say, n not directly in public health terms, but but obviously it was trying to apply an allied or uh, un an unanimous approach. Did you feel that you, as the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom government, had sufficient data, sufficient scientific advice as to what the position was on the ground in each of the other nations epidemiologically? Well, I think that when the the, the pandemic broke out, we uh, we were short of data about many things. I, we didn't even know the number. As like I said in my statement, we didn't even know the number of beds in the NHS. And it, and it took a long time to extract relevant data. There was a, a general continuing concern raised with you because Ms Sturgeon uh, wrote to you in September 2020 about whether or not the devolved administrations were receiving enough financial support in order to be able to enable them to put into place the public health measures that they had ordained. In, in essence, because they are devolved nations, they don't have access to the same levers of fiscal power as yep. the United Kingdom government. How was that issue resolved, or did it continue throughout the crisis? I think that the, the issue of financial support was obviously uh, allied or with the issue of, or, uh, of, of divergence of approach. Because clearly, uh, if it was open to a, um, a, a DA to take a, 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 for instance, a much more precautionary approach, or to, or to say that they wanted to, uh, to do X, Y, Z policy that would would be more expensive, um, then that was something that we were going to, that the whole of the UK exchequer was going to have to to cover. Um, now. Uh, that it, it wasn't that um, I wanted unity of message for that reason, uh, but that was an e that was certainly an extra complication. In his statement, Michael Gove says, in the early stages of the response, there were occasions when insufficient notice was given to the devolved administrations of decisions that were likely to be taken, and in her witness statement, Miss Sturgeon says. I believe both that communication should have been better and, more importantly, that the devolved administration should have been integral to that decision-making. Would you accept, perhaps with hindsight, that the decision-making process, insofar as involved the DAs, was not as good as it might have been? I think um, some, some form of integrated decision-making that doesn't leak is what you're after. Local government, it would seem that in March 2020, there was a deliberate decision within Downing Street not to invite the Mayor of London to meetings until the 16th of March. Um, he says that he made repeated requests to attend. He requested to attend COBRA on the 2nd, 9th and 12th of March, but was not permitted to do so. Did you know that? Do, do you agree with that? Uh, it's, certainly, London was very, very much in the in the, the forefront in the early stages of the pandemic, and I, I know that uh, the mayor of London was repeatedly consulted by uh, my advisers in, in in Number Ten. I'm sure that there, there was a lot of traffic between them and and uh, Sadiq Khan. I think that he was invited to a meeting on the from memory on the 16th. I may have that wrong, uh, but I certainly. Uh, spoke to him uh, pretty early on, but as you said right at the end of the last session, um, you know, we, we, we began by thinking we might uh, do London first, but then we dropped that idea. The Mayor of London was not invited to the government's formal crisis machinery, COBRA, until after the first national measures had been imposed by the United Kingdom government. Is that correct? And, and, and that is because we, we didn't, in the end, uh, do London first measures, and there was some sensitivity about um, other metro mayors. I think in relation to uh, the metro mayors, save on one occasion, the 12th of October, when the mayor of Liverpool, Andy Rotherham, attended, uh, no metro mayor was invited to attend COBRA at any time. The evidence from 
Sadiq Khan, from Mr. Burnham and, and, and Mr. Rotherham, is to the effect that there was generally insufficient information given to local leaders. And in the context, Mr. Johnson, of the local restrictions in the summer of 2020, and of course the tier system in October and December yeah. of 2020, that, that was a very significant failing, was it not? Well, um, I, first of all, I'm grateful to, uh, to uh, Mr. Rotherham, to Andy uh, Burnham, to uh, Mr. Khan, all the, all, the, all the mayors for the work that they, they did and the leadership they, they gave to, the, to their own communities. And, and you know, you talk about um, uh, Andy Burnham, you know, uh, uh, there, were, there, were several, there were parts of the country that barely came out of of uh, measures for the whole of the year. Manchester. And, uh, exactly. And they had a very, very tough time. Um, and we did our best to, to offer support and um, uh, to engage with them and uh, to help. But um, some of the negotiations, as I'm sure we'll come to, were, were extremely difficult. One of Sir Patrick Valence's entries appears to suggest that in relation to Manchester and Mr Burnham, a, a COVID-S meeting at which you were present um, openly drew a distinction between the support and measures that would be given to Manchester as opposed to Liverpool for nakedly political reasons. Would you agree? Did that Are you saying that I'm not, I'm not certain there was a Conservative mayor of Liverpool? No, it's that a view was taken upon the nature of the local leadership in Manchester and a view was taken about how cooperative it was being. Oh, I see. And therefore, Manchester would be treated differently right. to Liverpool. I don't remember that at all. Um, I think that Liverpool certainly was... The, the people they were hero, the people were heroic in trying to get mass testing going, and and, and again they, the, the, there was terrific hardship because of the of the lockdowns. But they made a, 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 a they were vital to the to the campaign to get mass testing going. Um, and another um, separate issue, please: the, the consideration of vulnerable and at risk groups. And and you'll appreciate, Mr. Johnson, that on account of your position as Prime Minister, many of these issues would only perhaps fleetingly have come to your attention and, of course, only at the, the highest possible level. And therefore, there is a distinct restriction on the detail um, into which we can go in, in debating them. Um, Helen McNamara, in her statement, makes this general point that a, across the advice and discussions in the Cabinet Office and in the heart of government, there was a striking absence of humanity or perspective about how people or families actually lived. And her sense was that the group of people in your inner coterie and in the Cabinet were a most homogenous group of people yeah. and were taking decisions that probably called for a much broader representation across society. Would you agree with that general proposition? I, 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 I think that there is um, some force in that. And, I mean... But um, so some force in the in the description of, of the of the people in in and around those meetings at some of the, those key times. Uh, I, I don't accept what Helen says about the the measures that we that we took. Um, but it is so. I, I know she said some things. I, I think and I you know pay tribute to Helen. She did an amazing uh, job. But I, I think that th it is not right or fair to say that. Uh, policy was conceived and driven forward without regard to the particular needs uh, of, uh, of women, for instance. Uh, the, 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 a huge amount of thought went into the question of hidden harms, of domestic violence. Uh, it, there was uh, the access to abortion, to, uh, to, to drugs uh, necessary. Um, the, uh, we put money into, uh, we had a domestic violence bill as you, you, you may remember, in I think March 
2020, which goes through the, the Commons very fast. We put money into ISVAs and IDVAs. We set up a helpline. We have a system whereby people, victims of domestic violence can, uh, can um, uh, identify themselves uh, without risk of I exposure by going to certain uh, premises. Um, we were very, very alive, and I was personally very alive to this issue. Um, so I, I was, you know, I was, I was surprised when she when she said that because I know how much she she cared about it, and, and I, I believe that we did a lot on that. Um, on on the broader question about, you know, leaving aside the the, the issue of, of gender, I think there the, the was a. And, it, it, and this needs flipping the other way around now. I think sometimes it, we didn't think hard enough about the uh, impact on, of lockdown on different groups. And it, sometimes, frankly, it was easy or much easier for uh, people with uh, professional jobs to sit out the... Uh, the lockdown than it was for for, for others, in, in, whether they're in the hospitality sector or, uh, or or whatever, and they and they and and, and a lot of people who, uh, you know, um, were on lower incomes really had a pretty a pretty tough time of it, and so and, and I think that it, it was vital to focus on on those people and to do everything we could to help them through lockdown. But also to realise that lockdown was hitting those groups particularly hard, and, and for, for me that was a a reason why you had to be so careful about going back into a national lockdown in uh, in October November. It's necessary to distinguish or between September the first lockdown and the second one, of course. Yeah. But Milady asked you earlier. To, to what extent did you consider the economic arguments against lockdown? And you said you had to give them short thrift. May we take it that on account of the speed with which the government had to act in that week of the 16th and 23rd of March, relatively little consideration was given by the government to the impact of lockdown well, similarly? I, I, think a huge amount of consideration, I think a huge amount of consideration was given by the government to, to the impact of both lockdowns, uh, and, and we thought about it extensively. I think that... No, no, not, not the general impact, Mr Johnson, but, but me. by reference to your earlier answer, the, the, the needs of individual sectorial groups, for example, but my name is limited to black people or, or BAME yes. sectors, it, it's... So it wasn't something that was at the forefront of the government's no, well, consideration I, I, in that sorry. week. So both lockdowns uh, were at the forefront of our consideration in, in, the, in their diverse impact. But also COVID was a subject of consideration because of what appeared to be its diverse impact. And as I'm sure you know, uh, we commissioned a lot of work into um, the way COVID seemed at first to be striking particular communities harder. But, but that wasn't apparent until April. At the 16th and the 23rd of March, there was great consideration given, of course, to shielding and to clinical impact. Yes. But there was relatively little, if any, consideration given to social impact upon the disproportionate way in which a national lockdown might impose itself and might impact upon various sectors in society. That's correct, isn't it? Well, where in the, where I, in, I, in, I, the in the notes and the minutes that you've been shown to is there open debate about the likely impact on the vulnerable and at risk of the national lockdown that was imposed on the 23rd of March? I think that you can find... Well, I, I, I couldn't point you off the top of my head to any particular text, but what I can tell you is that the whole time we were thinking, uh, look... Uh, who gets hit when you close non-essential retail and you close hospitality and uh, you, you stop people moving around, uh, it, the relatively affluent professional classes are, are probably going to be better placed to, to cope with this than, the, than, than others. And you will find that um, uh, there are... Uh, large numbers of, uh, of uh, 
black minority ethnic uh, community uh, members uh, represented in those sectors uh, who were particularly disadvantaged by the by the lockdowns. Yes, and and so you know whether or not you can find any um, mention of this in the uh, in in the in the material you've looked at, I, I I know that this was one thing that we were thinking about as a uh, as an ex, as a, a particular reason for being anxious about the effect of lockdowns. There was a general consideration at a generic level of the impact of lockdown. There was a clinical and financial consideration of those who needed to shield. There was a, a broad understanding that if the R rate could be brought below one and prevalence reduced, that would be for the greater benefit of all. But it wasn't until April and, and the first few weeks of, of May that the information started to come to light that members of the, the black and minority ethnic community were suffering more, that the, the lockdown was having a greater and disproportionate impact upon them. That's correct, isn't it? Uh, I don't remember exactly when it came to, to light, but it was intuitively obvious that it was uh, going to happen, and it was one of the reasons that we were. I was very cautious about going back into a, a national lockdown. That's later, of course. And, and, and to be fair, you... And it's one of the reasons, sorry, you... put it the other way around, it's one of the reasons I was keen to, to see if we could get moving again. Right. And, and you instituted a review. We've heard evidence that, that Kemi yeah. um, Bednock MP carried out a, a very extensive review um, over a number of, of years. I think over two years there were perhaps maybe a year there were four quarterly reports. That's right. You were, I think, less sympathetic to the needs of those persons suffering from long-term sequelae, that is to say, suffering from the condition known as long COVID. You questioned for quite some time whether or not that condition truly existed, and you equated it to Gulf War syndrome uh, repeatedly. Okay. Is that fair? Um, not, not really, no. But can I, can I, so can I just go come back on, 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 on that and say... Um, first of all, the, uh, the words that I scribbled in uh, the margins of submissions about uh, long COVID have obviously been now publicised, and I'm sure that they have caused a hurt and offence to a huge numbers of people who, who do indeed suffer from that syndrome. And I, I, I regret very much uh, using that language and should have thought uh, about uh, the the uh, possibility of future, of future publication. Uh, and I, I, I regret it very, very much. And what I was trying to do was to uh, get to the, to the heart of the matter, get to the truth of the matter, and to try to get my officials to explain to me exactly what the, the syndrome was. And it actually took quite a long time before I got a, a proper paper on it. Uh, I think it wasn't until, um, I, I, I get this wrong now, but I think it wasn't until, until 2021, summer of 2021, before I actually got a paper on, uh, on long COVID. But I did, as you say, ask uh, repeatedly to get some information. Uh, and that was so I could explain to people what we were doing and, and, uh, and, and what the, the issue was. Mr. Johnson, the point is that in October of 2020, you scribbled these remarks on a, on a report to you about the funding from the NIHR into a long COVID survey. You continued to make disparaging references to whether or not this was Gulf War syndrome stuff in February 21 in the context of a, an update given to you on the 21st of February. And then still later, in June 21, so nine months or so later, you were still questioning whether or not long COVID was to be equiparated with Gulf War syndrome. So it's not that, it's, it's, it's not that the, the, the challenge against you is you, you, you took a position on long COVID in the absence of um, a proper clinical understanding or advice from your advisors. It is that notwithstanding repeated 
the repeated placing of reports before you, you carried on questioning long COVID yeah. until many months later. Well, that, I, I'm not certain that's correct because I, I, I don't think I got a, a full explanation of uh, uh, or a full paper on it for until until the summer of the, the full paper was on the first of June 2021. That's correct, and you responded by saying thanks. So it's not exactly Gulf War syndrome. And that was yes. your take on the so, long COVID condition. So, but, but, but let's, uh, sorry, I know, it's no disrespect to, to, to long COVID uh, patients. And I, I saw uh, in the victim impact um, videos uh, some of the, the, the victims of, of long COVID. And I can imagine what a, a, a dreadful thing it is. Uh, but there are also, with Gulf War syndrome, many people uh, who have terrible symptoms for a very long time. There are also people who think they may be suffering, I think this is the now accepted, uh, from something associated with the Gulf War, but who are not in fact suffering from something associated with the Gulf War. So what I was trying to say was, um, where, is the, where is the line? And please can someone explain to me what this, this is? Because I was getting um, you know, anecdotal accounts of people who were suffering from it and I wanted to be able to, to say what we understood it to be and what we were doing about it. And what we were doing about it is fighting COVID, because the way to stop long COVID is to, is to stop COVID. One final topic in relation to, to, to the broad overarching issue of, of um, disparity. You, you indeed commissioned, as you've said, Mr Johnson, the, the report by Kemi Badenoch, um, who led a significant cross-government exercise on the disproportionate impact of COVID on ethnic minorities. I think following a report from Public Health England in June 2020. Do you happen to know why it was that that report, uh, that work done by Kemi Badenoch, didn't cover disabled persons? It's, it's, it's a technical question. It's, a, it's, a very it's good, not it's clear a very good why question. it didn't. It's a very good question, Mr Keith. I, I, I will make sure that the inquiry gets an answer, but I, I, can't, I can't give it to you off the top of my head. May we then now turn back to... And, the and it doesn't mean that the, the interests of the disabled were not looked at in some other Indeed. format, and I'm sure they were. N now, returning to the chronology and, and, and having just for the moment put, put to one side those overarching... Um, but general issues. Mark said, Will, um, you said earlier that um, Mark, now Lord Sedwell, suggested he, he should move on, uh, and you agreed. Um, could we have, uh, well, no, I don't think we need to put it up. Um, in his witness statement, Martin Reynolds, your private secretary, talks about the meeting that he'd arranged for you to meet with Mark Sedwell yes. on the 14th of May, and your diary shows a meeting with him on the 14th of May. I identified a slot on the 14th of May for me to run the Prime Minister through the findings of the review. You'll recall that Helen McNamara had produced a report and, and Mark Sedwell had himself produced a report. The Prime Minister decided instead to use this slot for a one-to-one -one conversation with Mark Sedwell where he told him that he had lost confidence in him. So which is it? Is it that you lost confidence in him, which is the question I asked you earlier, or is it that Mark Sedwell told you he wanted to move on and you agreed? Well, uh, Mark Sedwell did an outstanding job for this country uh, for a long time, and he was uh, a very distinguished uh, uh, secretary, I think, of the Home Office. He was a national security advisor. He's, he's, he's done everything. and. Um, I, I, I was, was and remain hugely grateful to his service. Uh, he wanted to move on. The evidence from Mr Cummings and Martin Reynolds and Helen McNamara is that regardless of the genesis of why he moved on or was effectively sacked, whichever way my lady concludes, that, that um, regardless, as I say, of that genesis, his departure, or his impending departure, <laughs> led to general bad blood, sowed chaos, says Mr Cummings. Mr Reynolds says um, damaged stability in the civil service, and Helen McNamara 
led to a real and damaging impact. It made those in the civil service in the centre less confident about challenging. No one was safe if the Cabinet Secretary was not. And dealing with the unravelling preoccupied a number of us for critical weeks. Would you agree that, that the consequences of his contingent departure did have wider ramifications, quite damaging impact, in fact, on the civil service in Number 10 and Cabinet Office? No, I don't think that's the case. I think that there was a um, fantastic array of, of talent in the, in the civil service, and that they did a, a very good job. I think that what, what did matter in that period, and the thing that was getting us all done, was the knowledge creeping, or otherwise, that this thing was coming back, and we we needed to deal with it, and it was going to be very hard, and, and we needed to get organised to do it. And that was, I think, the thing that made people scratchy. Helen McNamara prepared, as you know, a report on the workings of Number 10 in the Cabinet Office, and, and but without going through it in detail, because it's, it's been placed before the inquiry repeatedly, it identified very significant concerns in the working operations of Number 10 in the Cabinet Office, did it not? I saw, I saw the... Um, I've seen two versions of this document. Yes, uh, there was a draft and then yeah. a final version. So of I, the... saw the, I saw the final version. I think what this document reflected was a... Yeah, a, a civil service... Um, uh, unease about the uh, challenging uh, approach of of some of the special advisers, and I had to make a judgment about that particular issue, and I decided on balance that at a, a very difficult time for the country, uh, I'd rather have. A, uh, a number 10 where people challenged uh, ideas and where people brought new ideas and where people felt free to, to say things uh, than um, a number 10 where everybody uh, tried to pretend that all was continuously well because all was patently not well with the country and we needed to, we needed to fix it. So, so may we be clear about this, Mr Johnson, if your concern was that there had been a civil service unease about the challenging approach of some of your special advisers, and you plainly mean Mr Cummings there, your response was not to support the civil service and deal with Mr Cummings. You sidelined your cabinet secretary and kept Mr Cummings. Uh, well, that's your way of... of well, is that not what you did? I, I, I certainly... Look, uh, let me get back to... to, to to, to Sir Mark, um, he he decided he wanted to uh, to move on. That's what he that's what he told me. Um, on on the issue of my um, rest of my team and the 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 culture in in number ten, yes, it was it was occasionally argumentative, but I think that was no bad thing and. Um, uh, we 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 needed, frankly, to have a uh, an atmosphere in which people felt able to say things that were going to be controversial at the time. Mr. Johnson, without labouring the point, a great deal of evidence has been given to the effect that there were systemic problems in Number Ten and the Cabinet Office. Wrong people in the room, wrong people in the wrong jobs, people talking over each other. God complex, leadership issues, toxicity, misogyny, um, perpetual internecine warfare. Either you were aware of all that, in which case, why did you not act? Or if you were not, why were you not aware? So uh, or none of those things was put to me in the terms that you've just done, uh, first of all. Uh, nobody came to me and, and said, "This is, you know, this is uh, people have got gold complexes and internecine warfare going on uh, here." Uh, what I saw was a, a country that n needed uh, continuous, urgent action, and it needed solutions to be.
found. And what I wanted were meetings in which people could speak their minds without fear of um, being embarrassed or being seen to say something uh, foolish. And that's one of the reasons, by the way, why I sometimes spoke bluntly and freely in, in meetings. I wanted to give everybody cover to do the same. I wanted people to feel that they could, if they had a, 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 an idea, then I, I wanted to hear it. So, so can I just interrupt? I'm sorry, Mr Keith, I appreciate it. Can you hold that train of thought, whatever it was? Um, Mr Johnson, one of the reasons I've been interested in the culture in Number 10 is whether or not if there have been different structures in place, then you, this kind of culture may not have arisen and that might have provided you with a better framework for decision-making and seeking advice. And so, and I was looking, for example, we were looking at um, how initially the ministerial implementation groups, they didn't really work, and so yes. until eventually you got the COVID-S and COVID-O and they did work. And I was just wondering if you had a kind of structure whereby something like COVID-O, COVID-S, whatever, swept into operation the minute the Prime Minister said, right, this is... This is a dire emergency, yeah. a pandemic. Yes. So, that, so Might that help? Malay, Malay, look, I think that you, you put your finger on it. And that, the, 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 the problem, frankly, was that um, the, the, the system, the Cabinet Office, uh, the ministerial, the MIGs, uh, it was all too diffuse and things, in my view, only really started to come together when we had a, a, a rhythm of morning meetings where everybody could uh, say their piece and that would set the agenda for the day. That wasn't necessarily a decision-taking meeting, but, uh, but what I would submit is that um, for future pandemics, there needs to, there needs to be a... Uh, more clarity about which are the debating, the discussion meetings and which are the decision-making meetings. Because what would, what would happen is that I would be presented with a, a problem and then within the space of half an hour, we would have got to the solution and then we'd have to do it all again in a, in a, in a, in a separate format or, with, or, or through the cabinet or... Or, or whatever, and I, I think that some work. I mean, it, it's a it's a microscopic issue by comparison with with mu much of what we've been talking about. But some work needs to be done on those procedures, so that the prime minister has a uh, he, when he goes into some meetings, knowing that these are decision taking meetings, and is given all the evidence on both uh, sides of the argument, because that 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 was not happening. What was happening was. We were having a, a meeting. We'd say, "This is the uh, here's the problem. Uh, the R is taking off. We, the, the, the tears aren't working. What do we do now?" And I would try to come to an answer, but it. I felt that the structures were. You know, we had the difference between COVID O and COVID S, but to be absolutely. Um, Frank, I'm not, I, I don't think if I was sitting in a COVID-O or a COVID-S, I could have told you at any given moment whether it was a COVID-O or a COVID-S. Um, I was just sitting in, in, in meeting after meeting trying to, to deal with the, the problem. Now, that was the most effective way to do it. You needed to, be, you needed to be sitting permanently on the bridge trying to deal with it all. And, um, you know, back to the, to the culture... I had to make a, a, a decision about, and I, yeah, I knew that some people were uh, were difficult. I didn't know how difficult they were, clearly. Um, but I, I thought it was better on the whole for the country to have a, a, a disputatious culture in number 10 than one that was quietly acquiescent uh, to whatever I or the scientists said. Mr. Johnson, in a, in a WhatsApp to Mr. Cummings, you described him and you and your administration as having indulged in an orgy of narcissism. Th th that's not disputatious culture, is it? Um, I think, uh, with I think with respect, that WhatsApp was sent at the end. At the yeah, um, when I think 
um, things were becoming, you know, some of the things that were not obvious to me had become more obvious. 48313, page 17, is a WhatsApp. In May, in fact, so earlier in the summer, a WhatsApp from Mr. Cummings to you. I think it's a screenshot from Mr. Cummings's witness statement. If we could scroll into the top of the page. If Hancock texts really coming to meetings number 10, please just ignore. We urgently need to have meetings without him. That's Mr. Cummings. And, and then this, all too recognizable, we need to rebuild the government from top to bottom. We need to take over the cabinet office and run the whole thing. Yeah, it is this, this, is, this is me on the left, is it? Well, that was my question. Um, the top right is obviously Mr. Cummings, because yes. he's asking you to ignore Mr. Hancock's text, which says perhaps something about the yeah. system. Yeah, so this is... No, no, just wait right. one moment. Um, is it Mr. Cummings or you who says we need to rebuild the government from top to bottom, take over the cabinet office and run the whole thing? So what I'm, what I'm getting at here, and what this is, this is a, a reference. Uh, is this in May? It is, the 13th of May. Yeah. So this is, this is a reference to a, a plan that we, we hatched to try to um, do, have a massive data-driven revolution in government and to, to use COVID and the... Uh, this moment when we um, were finding out so much about people's um, propensities to, to illness of all kinds, to, to, to try to run a much more effective government. And we, and we, we opened a, a, a big office in 70 Whitehall, a, a big open plan, um, a bit like this, actually, uh, where the idea was that we would assemble data and we would, we would try and do things in a different way. I have to tell you, it was not a success. And, Mr. Johnson, and, it is well known that um, a new data system was set up, the 10DS system. Yes. It's called 10 Data System or 10 Downing Street, whatever your preference. And, and there was a greater provision of data throughout the summer of 2020, particularly from April, May onwards. But, but this message... It doesn't refer to data, does it? It doesn't refer no. to setting up a new data screen. It's, it it talks about rebuilding the government from top to bottom and taking over the cabinet office, yes. which wasn't, of course, itself responsible for data. It had multifarious functions, not one of which was the provision of data to central no, government. But, but sorry, the, the, what I meant, the, the, the office that we were that we created was in the cabinet office. Or it, it was in seventy. What is it was in seventy Whitehall. And so uh, that was what I was talking about. I, want, I, I, I agreed that things needed to, to change, and I wanted uh, a data-driven a data reform of Go government. On. Two further points on, the, on this topic, please. Firstly, um, Mr. Case's WhatsApp messages with his predecessor, Mark Sedwell, 303 245, page 1. I don't want to go through this line by line, Mr. Johnson, but if you just scroll your, scroll your eyes down the page, you, you'll see multiple references to the behaviour in Downing Street. And in essence, Mark said while saying, I've agreed to stay on for now subject to various conditions about behaviour and systems. Um, the, the fact that he says, I, well... I've agreed to stay on, may say something about his departure. But there are references on this page to not willing to agree to do any job in the version of the centre without guarantees on his conversations with the Prime Minister about behaviours. I will work where, for you where, in the sorry, Prime where, Minister. Sorry, where is this? You'll see that in the middle of the page. Oh, yes. There, there we go. Uh, 1805, 0829, so that, that passage, I'll not support any version of number 10 that undermines any cabinet secretary, let alone you. I'll do my utmost to support a prime minister, but I'm very, very cautious about walking back into this. There is then a reference to the conversation with you about behaviours at 1805-20-08-59. 1547, I don't want to go near these people. 
unless there are guarantees about behaviour. 1805, 20, 22, 50, 32. I'm here from everyone that you've made the Prime Minister see sense, and the only thing that is happening is creation of a COVID job. I'm almost more appalled that the Prime Minister has done all of this, and that's completely put me off my stride. <laughs> that has done all of this damage when all he really wanted was a point person for COVID. Um, 1805, 20, 22, 29, 46. I hammered the game playing COVID now, lead the work, fine if it sticks. I'm not sure he, that's you, saw sense. He just gave in when I made clear how angry I was at the behaviour uh, and so on and so forth. They made it is absolutely plain to you that there were very real problems in the operation of Number 10, in part because of the behaviour of Mr Cummings, in part because of your own approach to leadership and the decision-making, and in part because you had effectively sacked Mark Sedwell. Well, uh, so, several things. Uh, I don't remember any conversations about behaviour uh, with, with either of, the, of um, these, these people. Um, I, I don't remember um, any particular complaints being raised to, by uh, by Simon Case about anybody's behaviour. Um, I think that um, you know you, you you should take these points up with the, the current cabinet secretary. I understand you know he he, he can't. They've been taken up. Sadly. They've been taken up with. Mark Sedwell, who has been a witness in this inquiry, Mr Johnson. Well, um, all right. That, 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 that's good. But Finally. What I, what I would say is that I, I don't think it was a bad thing to have people who were willing to challenge the consensus and get things done. And, you know, whatever you, you may say about the government, it did get a, an awful lot of things done. And... Uh, and I think that's what the country needed at the time. And a lot of things were not done as well as they might otherwise have been done. Is that not equally possible? I, I think it's. Johnson? I think what is certainly th that's always true. But I don't happen to think that when it came to the management of the pandemic, and this is the I think the, the crucial thing, when it came to the management of the of the pandemic, the any ki any kind of. Um, differences, feuding, whatever, between officials, which I, I'm sad to say are just what happens in places like Number 10. I think any of that made the slightest difference to our processes and our decision-making. But you could have stopped it. If we look at... Um, well, we I would, think we probably need to move you, on. Well, there's, 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 one, there's one final point, which is a matter which, right. which um, my lady intervened to ask a question about when the evidence was given. I'm stopping you asking a question I wanted, right? OK. Yes. <laughs> the inquiry was shown uh, a WhatsApp from Mr Cummings, which was particularly offensive about Helen McNamara. I saw him. Yeah. It was sent to you and others in your WhatsApp group, but, but you maintained a silence and you never spoke up to say that is unacceptable and it cannot be allowed to go on on my watch. Uh, I... I I did see that, uh, and I, no, I don't remember it uh, now, but I don't remember seeing it at the, at the time. But I must have seen it because I was on the, on the group. You were. Uh, I've rung Helen McNamara to apologise to her for not having called it out and um, uh, uh, you know... Uh, so that, uh, if, if, you've, if you've done that... I, I've, apo I've apologised to her. Finally, um, this afternoon, the DHSC and Mr Hancock. A considerable amount of evidence has been given to the inquiry that the lead government department model may not have been appropriate for a whole system crisis like COVID. You understand what the lead government yeah. department model is. Um, it will plainly function well at the beginning. It may function less well when the whole of government is engaged and perhaps too much pressure is placed on the LGD. It can't accommodate the weight of the, of the whole system response. 
there is considerable material in Sir Patrick Vance's diaries and in the witness statement of Mr Cummings to the effect that there was a high degree of chaos in the DHSC, that there was operational inefficiency. Sir Patrick Vallance talks about this all the way through to May 2021. Were you aware that competent, very senior advisers in your administration held the view that the DHC had been overwhelmed and was operationally inefficient? Um, I was certainly aware that the, um, the DH, the Department of Health and Matt Hancock were coming under fire. Uh, and, but I want to go back to the high-level point I made earlier about uh, what all this signifies and how the, the ways in which it should be read and understood. Um, first of all, it's the kind of stuff that would never have previously uh, come out from any administration because it's, uh, it's now on uh, instant social messaging of a kind that previous, uh, previous governments didn't have. This is, this is, this is instant chit-chat uh, between people who would normally have said this to each other's face uh, wherever, uh, in the corridors or, or wherever. I'm, I'm so sec sorry. Sec sec no, Mr. Johnson, you? will you allow me? I'm so sorry to sorry, interrupt. Um, we, we, you may have misunderstood my question. Forgive me. The material consists not just of WhatsApps and evening notes but also witness statements, sure. which yes. talk about a high level of operational inefficiency or chaos, however you... Yes, so... so in, yeah. in, in, the, in the DHSC. I'm not talking about the, the more you. personal or intimate no, no, remarks in the WhatsApp. No, I, I totally understand. Were you aware that that view was I, taken I was, generally of the DHSC? I was aware, yes, certainly. I, certainly I was aware that the DHSC was under fire from loads of people. But that was hardly surprising, because the country was going through a horrific pandemic. And I just want to re so the, what I should have got quickly, more quickly to the point. The point is, you've got a lot of very talented, uh, sometimes uh, super confident, sometimes egotistical uh, people who are crushed with anxiety about what is happening to their country, uh, who are wrapped secretly with self-doubt and self-criticism, and who externalise that by uh, criticising others. And it's, it's, it's human nature. And one of the, when you're the leader in those circumstances, your job is to work out what is justified and what is people sounding off and what is political nonsense. And my judgment was that Matt was, on the whole, doing a, a good job in very difficult circumstances, and there was no advantage uh, in, in moving him as I was being urged to do. That was my judgment. And on the lead department point, I think that, um, yes, I think it was a huge burden on Department of Health to be the lead department for, for a while, uh, but that you know, rapidly morphed into uh, the centre running everything, and, and, and that was inevitable. What, what, why were, well, you, you suggest in, in response to my question that these criticisms were made because people were crushed with anxiety and wrapped secretly with self-doubt and self-criticism. Whatever the psychological mood of Sir Patrick Valance, Mr. Cummings... I, I'm not sorry, I don't wish no, no, to no, forgive those, me. Those no, psychological no, states for any for, individual, but... No, 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 no. We'll wait for the question, please. Whatever states they were in, and even if they were in a state of being crushed by self-criticism and self-doubt, that hardly explains why a significant number of witnesses describe objectively chaos inside the DHSC. Uh, well, I think it goes... Uh, I think the, the reason is that you've got a uh, once-in-a-century pandemic uh, for which, uh, sadly... Uh, the, there was no proper uh, preparation in the country because we, we didn't know how to deal with a, a, a highly contagious coronavirus pandemic. Uh, and all the pressure initially was on good, hard-working Department of Health officials uh, who, uh, of, of course, felt under huge, huge personal and professional uh, obligation to, to get things right, and who naturally uh, 
were in a, in a, in a state of, uh, of great anxiety. And, and you know, I just must get back to my point. The, the, my job was to decide whether the, um, that problem, which I think was inevitable, could be solved by moving people or whether we had to forge on. And I thought it was better to forge on. Regardless of the state of the individuals in the DHSE and acknowledging the remarkable and extraordinary efforts made by so many people individually within and without government to respond, it was part of your function as Prime Minister to ensure that the lead government department, the DHSE, was responding and dealing with the crisis as best it could. You were obliged to ensure that your government was operating properly, systemically. You knew that other advisers, senior advisers in your administration, were telling you that the DHSC was not operating well. It was chaotic and dysfunctional, and there were very real concerns being expressed about its Secretary of State. Why did you not take a grip on that issue? Because, I, because uh, first of all, I thought that the permanent secretary at the Department of Health, Chris Wormold, was outstanding. Uh, and um, I, secondly, for the reason, for, I, re I repeat what I have said. I thought in the circumstances that Matt Hancock was doing a good job, he's extremely, he, well, he's intellectually able, he was on top of a, uh, the subject, and whatever his failings may or may not have been, I didn't see any advantage to the country at a critical time to the country in moving him in exchange for someone else when I couldn't be sure that we were necessarily going to be trading up. And I thought it was, I thought that, I did think about it, of course I thought about it, but I thought that was the best thing to do. But what we, what we also did was we took control and the management of the pandemic was, was basically centralised in number 10. So is this a nub of it? Throughout April, May, June, July, you were aware that a number of senior advisers and civil servants were highly critical of Mr Hancock. You were told by Mark Sedwell around the 2nd of July that you should sack him. You were aware that he had a tendency to overpromise because you debated long and hard with Mr Cummings the merits of what you had been told about testing. And there was a general lack of confidence that what he told you was accurate, but that you stuck by him for good or ill. I, I didn't stick by him uh, for uh, you know, any, um, any reason other than that I thought, uh, on the whole, in incredibly difficult circumstances, he was doing a good job, that it was not obvious to me that the, that the trade, that the moving him would be worth the disruption. And I also thought, which is true, that in any political environment, at some stage, somebody is always telling you to sack somebody. And that is just, is just what I'm afraid what happens in politics. And so I, I had to aim off. And the last question, off. please, on this. In his witness statement, Mr Cummings says, in the summer of 2020, Mr Johnson refused to replace Mr Hancock despite repeated requests from me, both cabinet secretaries and many others, and being told repeatedly that leaving him there guaranteed further disasters and deaths in the autumn. His political secretary told me the Prime Minister wanted to keep Mr Hancock as the sacrifice for the inquiry. Now, that is, of course, you may say, a piece of double hearsay, but Mr Cummings has it in his witness statement, and therefore you need to answer it. No, well, sure. Well, I don't remember that at all. And, um, and it's, it's nonsense. Um, the, my thinking was very straightforward. I, I, I had a, a health secretary who was able, who was a good public communicator, in my view. Um, I, I felt that um, whatever his defects, I wasn't clear that uh, uh, we were going to 
trade up by, by doing a swap. I thought it was a very, very difficult time to do that. And I wasn't persuaded by the arguments. And I don't, by the way, remember, I mean, he says both cabinet secretaries. I don't remember either of them specifically saying this, but, you know, maybe, maybe the, I certainly remember, I certainly remember um, there was, there was anti-Department of Health militating, that's for sure. On the 2nd of July, Mark Sedwell WhatsApps Simon Case and says, I told the Prime Minister to sack Hancock to save lives and protect the NHS. Right. But you don't think he did... Did you ask him, him about that? Indeed. <coughs> right. I mean, I'm, I'm not... I'm, I, don't, I don't remember him saying that in so many words. There we are. Milady, is that a convenient moment? It is. Thank you very much. Um, a very long day for you, Mr Johnson, I'm afraid. Thank you. Another long day tomorrow, um, but that will be it. Uh, we'll finish tomorrow. Thank you. So, uh, 10 o'clock tomorrow, please. Thank you, Melinda.